Tactical Shooting Volume 8. I'm Matt Burkett. I'm here with John Paul from JP Enterprises and Mark Buchanan from 3-Gun Gear. We're going to help you select the right shotguns for the task at hand, pick out the ammo, pick out the modifications and equipment for the guns, and make sure you keep them running. We're also going to help you with a bunch of shooting tips that will take your shooting to the next level. So let's get on to figuring out which guns you need to work with. The primary guns used in practical shooting in law enforcement applications are the Benelli series, which is the M1 through the M4. The, uh, the uh, Benelli's are the M1, M2 is the newer series, M3, and then the gas-operated M4. Uh, the M1s are the dominant Benelli in the uh, in the three-gun industry. Okay. Uh, the M1 is a uh, uh, inertia recoil operated gun, as Benelli describes it. The M2 is their new version. It's kind of an updated, a little more stylized per se, a couple of differences on the uh, operations. The M3 is a selectable pump auto, so you could use it in either classes, you know, pump class or auto class, theoretically. And then the new M4, which is the gas-operated version of the Benelli. Okay. So you can really pick out, out of that line, whatever you want to use. Yeah, they all have their, you know, pros and cons, individual preferences, stocks, features, the way they look. Well, does just, just the way they function will affect their recoil and shootability when you're, when, of them. Yeah, when you're shooting a 12-gauge, when you get to a certain load, there's not a huge difference in recoil. Okay. I mean, there is some. Uh, Again, it's, you know, as we're going to talk about throughout the video, how to keep them running, the things to make the guns reliable so that all the guns can work equally as well. Okay. Now, the um, 1100 series of guns includes the 1100 and the 1187. Right. Remington's been making uh, the 1100s for, uh, oh, I don't know how many years, as long as I can remember. And some years back, they came up with an improved version called the 1187, which uh, solved a, a couple of issues they had. Uh, for example, the outside of the magazine tube had a tendency to rust any 1100s because it was carbon steel and they introduced a stainless magazine tube which solved that problem. And they put in a, a, a variable gas system which actually uh, allowed you to use rounds that had a, a wider range of port pressure and still had the gun, have the guns operated. Okay, and we'll get into discussing port pressure under the vocabulary of shotgunning. Right. Because a lot of people don't even know what that is. Now, when we go on to um, getting started in the sport, a lot of people get started out with a pump gun. Correct. It's a, it's a again, the base gun, uh, definitely the least expensive of everything to get into the sport. You've got the uh, Remington 870s and the Mossberg 500 series, okay. which are the two dominant pumps, uh, pump action shotguns in the sport. Now, that's mainly for He-Man class. Well, I that, I, or, it, or either people starting out or He-Man. There's it's required in He-Man. Only in some matches. <laughs> some matches require a 12 gauge. Okay. Some require a 12 gauge pump. Okay. But almost everybody on the planet has a 12 gauge pump. Right. Under the bed or in their safe, so it's a great gun to get started with, and and you know it's it's just a different style of shooting, single okay. stack versus high cap. Type okay. Of thing. Uh, what's the difference between like the 500 series Mossbergs and the Remingtons? Is there um, benefits either way? The uh, the biggest feature between the two guns is is the loading gate area. Okay. On the uh, 870s, it actually has a loading gate that you have to overcome, uh, and the 500 series, the loading gate's not there or it, it's hidden up inside. Okay. So it's one thing out of the way. You can actually just drop around in and thumb it in. Uh, correct. Well, it's just one less thing to overcome while you're loading. Okay. A few of the special safety notes that are very critical is on the Remington 1100, when you have the trigger group out of the gun, what you're going to find is there's some extraordinarily sharp edges inside the receiver area right here, and that everybody I know that owns an 1100 has cut themselves open on those. So be careful with your fingers on that. Now, on a uh, shotgun, when you're going for reloads and stuff, you yeah. want to you want to have a glove for that left hand. Yeah, a lot of people don't have the strength in the forearms, and when they come to reload, they'll wrap their thumb around it right here, and uh, you'll cook your skin pretty darn quick. After 20, 30 rounds, that thing just... Right. And you burn your hand pretty good. And then uh, on the Benelli's, specifically when loading rounds, people have a tendency to put their thumb in and try and bring it straight up as opposed to straight back. I'll grab one of our dummy rounds here. Yeah, so you'll... Uh, what happens nice is... Nice and slow. People go in, and they catch their thumb on this loading gate here. 
Oh, coming out with it. They try and come out right. as opposed to putting it in and coming straight back out. We're going to have John show you what happens with your thumbs and fingers in the ejection ports. Yeah, this is another uh, one of those common identifying features among all 1100 owners. Uh, they'll probably have some portion of their thumb uh, missing from having it caught by the extractor in the ejection port. And it's really easy to do this because typically most of the guns are equipped with this, this extended uh, carrier here. So when you're trying to clear a malfunction or, or do something uh, uh, with your thumb in the ejection port or any finger, it's very easy to, to trip this and all of a sudden that thing comes forward with quite a bit of force and it's going to puncture your finger with the, with the ejector here. So that's, a, that's something to be avoided. I, it, it's kind of like a CNH Auto Finger. I've got one of those too. If you have ever, anybody who's owned a CNH Auto Champ, they've got a, uh, a rim of a 45 case cut right into their finger. So it's an identifying factor. One of the other problems is uh, in open gun shooting, which is what I do primarily, uh, I don't shoot limited or tactical, but I use these tech loaders which are a feeding device, puts four rounds in at a time. Um, one of the things you want to make sure of with these is that I'm going to actually do a, a load on the gun here. Now we've got all dummy rounds, just so you may... You know, weighted dummy rounds. Weighted dummy rounds. Um, Dylan Precision was nice enough to load us up some dummies. And uh, so you just hit this and you make sure that any of the tech loaders you have right here it's a very critical piece, actually. There's a cut here. If that cut or notch isn't on those tech loaders, you better cut it in yourself or return them because that can actually roll across the primer area and fire the round in the magazine tube. Yeah, that was one of the problems earlier when they first came out with these was that uh, uh, people were modifying them with these little sticks. Right. And they had screws and such in there, and there was a few problems that occurred. Well, ju just the rounded top part Correct. was causing it. Correct. Uh, because the primers on the shotgun ammo are so big that it would roll over the primer. So make sure you have the correctly cut tubes. Um, the other one, ma or the other major issue I want to talk about is shooting at steel plates with slugs. If you uh, have a steel plate that you have to shoot at with a slug, make sure it's at least over 40 yards. Uh, and make sure the plates are in pretty good condition because I've, I've seen splatter back even from plates 60, 70 yards if the plate's in bad shape. It's either cratered up or it's got some holes and pockets in it. You'll get some chunks back at you. So that's some special safety notes just to pay attention. Use loaded dummy or weighted dummy rounds, you know, so they add some realism to this thing, but you don't have any real ammo or live ammo in your training area. So when you're doing drills like this or function tests and stuff like that on the gun, make sure you're safe with your with your dummy rounds and your ammo. Don't get your fingers caught in there. That hurts like heck. With the insertion of the rounds um, in the limited guns, make sure you're straight in and out so you don't trap that thumb underneath and get the Benelli thumb. And you don't get the 1100 thumb catcher, uh, capturing it in the bolt area. Okay, before we get into the rest of this, what we want to do is lay it down a basic foundation of vocabulary so that you can better understand what we're going to talk about later when we get into ammo selection and, and diagnostics and maintenance. Mark, why don't you start with the Benelli? Uh, well, on the Benelli, you know, the, the, uh, the gun's broken down into your components. Uh, you know, there's your different sighting systems. This has got rifle sights. Uh, your magazine extension on the front here. You've got a barrel clamp. Your fore end. Uh, obviously, your receiver on the Benelli, it's a little bit different. It has two extra parts, or buttons, I should say. It's got the bolt release, which is the button, and then underneath here, there's a small silver, butt, uh, small s silver release that's the shell release. That would actually release the shell out of the magazine. Uh, trigger group, safety, stock. This is actually a field stock compared to some of the different stocks that we have here. Again, the different stocks can fit different people in different ways. Uh, and then, of course, you have your butt pad. Um, on the opposite side, there's the uh, side saddle, um, sling swivels, which I've taken off the front one, uh, your loading, loading gate, and uh, uh, of course your charging handle, which there's several different types. On the 1100, you've got an open 1100 here. Yeah, we've got uh, both a full-blown uh, open shotgun and uh, an example of a tactical shotgun. Uh, pretty similar nomenclature, obviously. This part is the extension. The actual magazine tube is underneath here. 
uh, on the open shotgun, we're allowed to have some porting. So you can see there's some ports on the barrel. We've got a clamp that's positioned here, and that keeps the uh, magazine tube from breaking off under the torque of recoil. So you want to support that. The longer it is, the more that's necessary. Not so necessary on guns that have the shorter tubes. This happens to be a special compensator that uh, is allowed on, in the open class. Also, we've got an optical sight that's melted into the barrel here. Uh, again, optical sights being allowed in that class, but not in the uh, tactical or limited class. Now, this is the J-Point sight that you guys actually... Yeah, that's uh, a site that we, we private label there for, and uh, actually has many applications. And Because of its size and uh, near weightlessness, we can use it for uh, a great number of applications. It melts right into the, into the barrel there, and uh, even if it goes out, you can still shoot the top of the rib there. So it's kind of got a built-in backup system on it. Okay. Uh, on the... Uh, one of the differences between the Benelli and the Remington here is uh, this does not have a button that releases the carrier. The carrier or bolt is released by the, by the uh, carrier or the, or the carrier extension here. When you hit that, of course, that releases the, the bolt. And uh, it's kind of touchy. It takes very little force for that to, to happen. So uh, a lot these, of people, that's where a lot of people catch their fingers is they'll, they'll do this and accidentally bump it because you can yeah. set it down on a table and have the carrier go yeah, forward. It's, it's like a mouse trap. It's, <laughs> it's just <laughs> that, that, that quick. And that's when it comes forward, it, it really flies. Uh, this happens to have an, an Arredondo uh, loading chute here that guides those sticks in at the right angle. One of the problems with the tech loader, uh, the tech loader uh, speed sticks for some people is getting this angle right on the gun. And this, this provides that function so that when you come in here, it grips the, the two ears on there and you just press it in and now it's at precisely the right angle so that it feeds in. And uh, uh, all things in a perfect world that uh, you'll get four <laughs> rounds in the gun. The, uh, th this, when it comes out of the gun, would be called the trigger assembly or the fire control group in the parlance of the industry. Uh, we've got a couple different types of op level levers here on these guns that uh, are enlargements of the original equipment one that allow you to you know, facilitate operating the action quickly op if you have to. Op lever is also the bolt handle. Bolt handle, op okay. lever, right. Uh, you also notice that uh, the, we've got an extended piece on here that comes below the receiver and on the Remingtons this really helps to facilitate getting the rounds in, especially single loading because uh, you can uh, when you press that down, it, it gets the carrier lever all the way out of the way and allows you to clear the, the uh, loading or the magazine tube on the gun a little bit better. You notice we've got it cut off so that it's more difficult to catch your finger on these things. It, usually the way they come is about this much longer, about a half an inch longer, and then it's very easy to spear the end of your thumb on them when you're pulling your thumb out. Yeah, I've cut my thumb open on them too. The butt stocks, you can see we got uh, there's different heights of the comb. This is cons considered the comb here, and you can see that... Uh, now, the comb area is where your cheek rests. That's right. So you want to get the proper cheek weld on the gun to allow you to, when you shoulder the gun, you don't want to be moving your head around. You want to have the right cheek weld so that you've got the right sight picture over the top of the gun. Okay. So that's the, uh, the big deal where that comes in. Go ahead and set those down for a second. Is when, I'm going to get the dummy round out of there, is when you mount the gun up, like this has a fairly high set of sights on it. They're mm -hmm. above the rail. Right. And if you had the standard type of, of cheek, see, there's that mouse trap again. <laughs> the standard cheek piece on here, you wouldn't have your eyes in line with these, with these sights. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mount this up for you, and you'll notice that it actually picks my head up off the gun a little bit, and I've got a good cheek weld going on, versus this has just a, a bead front sight, and You'll actually see I sit down on the gun quite a bit differently with my head, and it puts me more in line with the barrel with this for this type of sight. Um, on my personal shotgun, my uh, Bevan Graham's Benelli here, you'll notice that it's got the J-point sight mounted onto the barrel because I shoot open class. Um, I've got my custom comb height modification and that, and here. A beautiful one it is. Yeah, yeah, tape. yeah, but I tell you what, a little bit of cushion there makes a difference when you're shooting <laughs> all those full house slugs. Um, and you'll notice my, my head ends up exactly in line with the right area on the gun. So setting up your, your head height is extremely critical, and that's related right there to that, that yeah, comb area. Fitting the, uh, the stock length and the comb height. Right. You can shoot a gun that's too short. You can't shoot a gun that's too long for you. Well, the stock length, the, the way I've seen to set that up for people, first of all, stock length is from... When you mount the gun up, where your head sits on the gun, pretty much, you correct? Know? Is it 
It's about the yeah. best description yeah. I can find of it. Um, one of the things I don't want to have happen is where my fingers are here and I come up, if the stock's too short, I'll actually smack myself in the face under recoil. And so I need, I personally need a much longer stock than most people. Um, that's kind of curious here. Let's see if these stocks are, they're almost, almost the same length. So you guys run fairly normal length stocks probably on your guns. Yeah, typically about 14 half length of pull. Uh, the, uh, the, a lot of the competition guys are taking and shortening the stocks for different types of positions. And if you run a, a tactical shotgun, if you're running armor or anything else or any type of thicker clothing, you, you need want a shorter to, stock. You'll need a shorter stock for it. Uh, to set up that stock length, the real quick tip is to take, get the grip here, put the gun right in the crook of your elbow, and if it's, if it's sitting like this, your stock's going to be too short for you. You're probably going to hit yourself in the face. Correct. If you can't do this, you're going to be really awkward working with the trigger and fire control mechanisms. The, uh, the one thing I like about the Benelli's is they do offer a shim kit that uh, is, it allows you to angle the stock to bring up the, the comb height as opposed to actually changing the stock out itself. Well, you can change the stock out or you can do what I've seen one of the other top shooters doing out on his back patio. Bang, 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 bang. Bend it, grind a little bit on the stock and move it around. I'll tell you, that can be kind of dangerous on a, an 1100 series shotgun because you've got a, an, an action tube assembly that holds the spring and that angle is actually pretty critical through here. And so if you change the angle of this tube coming through here, at some point it's going to bind up the link and the action assembly and of course your gun's going to stop, stop functioning. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want so. to have that. Um, the one other thing we need to cover are chokes. On most of the, uh, the shotguns we use, the uh, majority of people actually have interchangeable chokes. And they just simply screw in the end of the barrel Let's as I here. reach for my shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Right, hand you the right gun there. <laughs> hand me the right gun. Uh, again, choke key. Um, on, as you see here, the, the first problem you run into with the extended magazines is you Choke key doesn't work. Choke key doesn't work real good. So, if your choke's clean, right. you can actually just spin it out, and that's probably you know we we'll get into maintenance later. That's probably almost never nobody ever cleans those. No, I I know that you taught me that lesson yes, personally, yes. and it's, and then I took and ground the rust off of mine. That's a good thing. That's a good um, thing. And I think my uh, improved cylinder was actually a full choke at that point. Uh, because there was a, about a quarter inch of plastic wad stuck inside the choke. Right, we'll, we'll get into the maintenance thing Right, but the, but the different choke sizes, the simplicity of it is, you've got, one. Uh, say an example of a pattern at 20 yards for, you've got a cylinder bore, which is the biggest one, right? Correct. And then you've got improved cylinder, and Correct. what's next? Modified. And modified, and it's going to tighten up the pattern all the way through. Then you've got improved, improved modified. modified, and then? Full. Full. Okay, so full is going to give you the tightest pattern out there. Well, they're super full, well, too. Well, there's, there's extra full and then skeet, I believe, on the downside. Right. Well, skeet is just slightly under cylinder bore, if I remember right. Uh, yeah, significantly under cylinder bore. I mean, no, I mean, uh, under improved cylinder. Improved cylinder. Yeah, so it goes right, cylinder. Right. Cylinder, skeet, you know. Improved cylinder. Right. Yeah, so uh, you've got to find out, and, and barrel length will change the way the load shoots. Yeah, the, your patterns will change with the barrel pellet length, size. pellet weight. Choke. So that's something I think we're going to cover. Yeah, we're going to get into that later on because there is so much detail required. Right. Okay. Um, go ahead. Let's just talk a little bit about the 872 because there again, total you know departure from these semi-autos has no bolt release. Obviously, it doesn't need one. But what it does have, if the gun is charged, it has a, a carrier release here, which allows you to unlock it and unload it without having to fire it. Under live fire conditions, when you fire the gun, the hammer comes down and it actually, right now you see the gun's locked up, you, can't, you cannot uh, open it up, but when the hammer falls, it releases the action, making it possible to cycle it again. So right here, be uh, your carrier release. Otherwise, now that's got a bead front sight on it, right, John? Yeah, bead front sight, low comb. And then this one here is one of the Benelli's with the, uh, the ghost rings on it. Again, it, it turns into a personal preference as far as which sighting system you like. Right. Um, the ghost rings are handy if you're shooting slugs. Uh, I prefer actually notch and post style sights. Uh, the, the ghost rings for me just never really worked with my brain on a shotgun. For me, there's two more ears on the front. Right, I and mean, you've got, on, on the factory Benelli here, 
You've got, uh, let's see if we can get a shot of that. You've got the uh, three wing problem here and, and you bring the rear sight up and you don't know what exactly to put around it. Hopefully the big white dot in the middle kind of guides you, but. <laughs> you never know if you're gonna see that under stress. Okay, let's move on to a discussion of some of the ammo terminology. The next complicated issue under vocabulary is really the ammunition. Shot shells, slugs, shot size, pellets, you know, what, what does it do? And what are the sizes? What are dram equivalents and everything else on the box? You, know, you buy the uh, you buy the box at Walmart. And it's got all sorts of information on it. But what does that mean? It's what just not it written from? in English. No, it's not. It, well, it actually might be written in English, but not actually, American. We'll call it actually old English because old English. that's when black powder started. So uh, I have to use my cheat notes here because there, there's a lot of technical information. On the uh, on the ammo box, it gives a dram equivalent. Okay. That's re relating to black powder. All right. So as an example, one dram, I believe, is like one sixteenth of an ounce. Of powder. Of black powder. Of black powder. So this is all going back to historical way that shotguns used to be loaded with black powder. And really? it's, it's just carried over. So uh, a dram of powder is a sixteenth of an ounce or one two hundred and fifty sixth of a pound. All right. <laughs> Glad that's easy to work with. And, and the way it works, and, and the, it, it's a certain amount of powder. So a three dram weight of powder pushes a certain weight of shot, whether it's a, a one ounce. Okay, it an ounce at a eight. certain speed. Yeah, and so your dram equivalent will change relative to your shot size, or I should say your velocity will change with your dram equivalent and your shot weight. So you can have a, this is how <laughs> it works. It's really, it's, 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 it's basic, but it's a mystery. Um, in today's comparison, three grams of powder is approximately 40 grains of powder. Depending on which powder manufacturer. No, 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 this is just like a, a, a base. Okay. A three drams of powder is equivalent to 40 grains of powder. Okay. 40 grains of powder is about twice as much powder that you actually need for a, a shot shell to load it. A three dram load. Correct. So you, you can't correlate black powder and oh, smokeless so, powder. So if you actually reload the ammo, yeah. don't use a dram equivalent. Don't yeah. use use the, the new modern tables, and there's books on loading shotguns. It's probably one of the more complicated things to load. So they should actually be putting just flat out velocities on the boxes instead of dram equivalents. That would help them. us out a whole lot. I mean, if we knew it was like, you know, 1350 feet per second, Auto and it's a one out. the barrel. Well, then you get into the barrel length differences in your burn rates of your powder. John? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, yeah, we've got a whole really archaic and obsolete uh, nomenclature system that's still used and so we have to learn how to how to live with that today and what it, what it means in terms of what we want to do with with the shells and what we need to choose and, for and, when we're shooting right and of course the the whole black powder thing uh, I mean black powder is uh, relative to modern smokeless powder powders it was a very low energy high bulk and so that's why dram equivalent you end up with uh, volumetrically, of course, if you use drams, you'd, you'd be in some big trouble because uh, we're... You know, <laughs> You're going to go boom right. instead of bang. <laughs> a lot of boom. And, and the wad systems, uh, everything that was used back then and, and black powder shotguns, totally different than what we have today. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, uh, do you want to uh, show up at a match and walk into Walmart and, and go in there and buy a, a, a two dram equivalent with a half ounce of uh, shot in some dove and quail or squirrel and rabbit or dog and pony load? Well, is that, is that going <laughs> to run your gun? Pro probably not. And probably won't knock the target so down. So what we read, the, the first thing about the ammo is uh, reliability. I mean, what, what, how do you interpret on the box whether or not it's going to cycle your semi-automatic shotgun, whether it be gas operated or inertially operated? Or on a pump gun, whether or not it'll be so high pressure that it'll actually seize up in the chamber. I've seen that happen on some of the really high pressure loads. Some of the three and three quarter gram gun or stuff has actually sealed the chamber up so hard you got to really crank it to get it out. Right. Yeah. That's a possibility that the the case head expands into the chamber in such a way that uh, you can't overcome it with the with the with the manual action. Right. You know. Uh, of course, on the upside, just about anything that you can fit in a pump or a manual upper shotgun uh, will work. So the dog and pony load will work in the, as in the pump. As long as you're snake now, and squirrel. Whether, yeah, you're snake, <laughs> whether it will actually knock over the target or have to accomplish what you have to do, well, that's, an, that's another issue, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
But let's just look at, say, what it says on the box relative to whether it will actually cycle the, the shotgun. And that is a, probably one of the main reliability issues that people have with the shotguns. They think that, well, I've got a 12 gauge, it should be able to work with any off the shelf factory 12 gauge load. Not so. And the thing that people really need to pay attention to, other than the correct caliber, being uh, 12 gauge, and 16 where did that gauge. gauge thing come from? Well, again, that gets back to the old <laughs> archaic way that what is a were gauge? Designed. You know, let's start with gauge. <laughs> okay, what's 12 gauge? Well, a 12 gauge, the way it's the way it was derived is you have a lead ball of a 12 gauge diameter, and it takes 12 ball, 12 of these lead balls to equal one pound. Okay, so on okay, like, so on a 16 gauge, you have the diameter of the bore of a lead ball, and you have 16 of these lead balls to equal a pound. Same with the 28 gauge. The only one that's different is the 410. The 410 is actually actual a bore. is an actual caliber size. And a 28 gauge would be the same. You'd as You'd have 28 ones. lead balls that would fit inside that barrel to equal one pound. Wow. There, there another obsolete little piece of, uh, you know, information as to why gauges are what they are. Well, pretty much, uh, just for people that are watching this, uh, buy a 12 gauge because the most ammo is available for it, the most accessories are available for the guns. And we're going to stick to discussing the 12 gauge as far as our ammo selection, just because it's going to keep things a lot easier. Well, the, the, the nomenclature will equate to any of the calibers, but it's going to be more specific to the applications that we want. Okay. So on the 12 gauge, let's, let's start at the top of the round. We've discussed the, uh, well, we've discussed the powder, but the, the actual BBs, the little pellets, we've got nines, eights, seven and a half, sixes, fours, or well, we got fives, it, fours. You go all the way from one to nine. They're all the way down to one, okay. I believe so. I've, I've never seen a one or two or a three. Yeah, they're more, then actually. Oh, wait, go, I've seen a three over Well, they here. actually start at BBs, one through nine. Okay, and then you got the double up bucks. It actually goes all the way up to 12 in rimfire. Uh, Shot. <laughs> you ever of seen course. that? 12. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the 12 gauge. Um, <laughs> Which we might have an application for, you know? <laughs> yeah. now, now, in our sport, I found that, uh, you know, the shot size that I typically use is uh, a 9 and a 6. Okay. John, what do you, what do you like? Uh, I've got uh, a few, uh, you know, pet loads that, uh, that, like the Fiocchi spreader. I like these in 9s. Because for the same reason, uh, high pattern density, and all you need is one BB on a frangible target to break it, so let's get as much out there as we can. And you actually That's have to break, break the target as opposed to fragment the target. Yeah, all you and need you is one hole in it. it. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and those things are like throwing a picnic table at it. You right. Know? You don't have to aim it like a rifle or a shot, you know, like a rifle and be right on the thing. Right. You, can, you can be three feet off of it at 20 yards and you're going to dust it. What, uh, what weight of shot do you like? How much shot? It depends on what, I've, what I have to do. Uh, their, uh, Winchester has a sporting clays load that has uh, one ounce of uh, seven and a half or eights traveling at about 1350. And then we, we should also relate that back to this whole dram equivalent thing too. Uh, that round happens to have adequate port pressure to cycle most gas operated guns and I'm not sure how it works in the Benelli's, I haven't tried it, but it, it will cycle most of the gas operated guns. And of course because of its uh, its velocity and, and the uh, low payload, it's got a very sharp, easy, snappy recoil impulse, so it's very controllable, say, on, on short range, like plate racks, something like that I might use it on. However, if I've got full-size poppers out at 35, 40 yards, well, then I'm going to be reaching for an ounce and a quarter field load in either fours or sixes. And you might even change your choke up for it. Maybe. I, I personally don't like to change my choke tubes, and that's one of, the, one of the alternatives. If you want to tighten up your pattern, of course, uh, you can do a lot towards that by just changing the load before you get into ch actually changing your, your, your choke tube. Right. Just a little aside on that, I, uh, yeah, I, right, I don't like to change my, my uh, choke tube just because I, my, my slug zero is so important to me. I don't want to take any chance of losing that, and I think that we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah, so that's another variable. That's right. Another, right. Now, well, my, now, my understanding of the <clears throat> operating parameters of the off-the-shelf shot, off shotgun, say that four times fast, Yeah. Good luck. is it requires the, the, the recoil energy that's generated by an ounce and an eighth, three and a quarter dram load. I know it's specified by Remington, and my understanding for Benelli, that's the base shell to operate the gun reliably. And everybody's trying to run a one ounce, two and three quarter dram or three dram load in their guns. Correct, to drop down that recoil. Yeah, but the guns require a certain amount of gas pressure and a certain amount of recoil energy to actually cycle the gun. 
Well, we're going to let John deal with the uh, 1100s and talk about how to get them to work, even though he won't work on your personal 1100 if you ship it in. <laughs> you have to send in a new one. <laughs> but um, back to the shells, the one thing, how did they come up with <clears throat> seven and a half, six, five? How or why? Um, I can only guess that it, it's, a, it's an application specific for hunting. You know, for a six will kill a rabbit, but a seven and a half won't. Well, it depends on how close the rabbit is and how much <laughs> you throw at it. Okay. Okay. So if I you're shooting, if you're shooting fast-moving birds, okay, you want it, they don't have a lot of feathers, so they're they're lighter to penetrate. So you can use a lighter shot, and you need more of them in the air because you need a a bigger broom per se, pattern density, pattern density to get them. I I think it's actually related. Um, the original was a specific size relation to that volumetric measurement of how many pieces of lead shot will go into an area. Okay, now back to my little cheat sheet here. Right. It's, um, it's, you know, if, if, if you start with, and I've got listed here, one ounce, ounce and an eighth, an ounce and a quarter. Okay. And uh, we'll start with the number nine shot. It's the smallest shot. It's .08 inches in diameter. Okay, little, little tiny shot. Little shot-y. tiny BBs. Um, in a one ounce cup, you have 485 pellets in a one ounce cup, and that would be yep. this, this portion of the shell right. here. You've got 485 chances to break the clay. Target. Correct. Now, if you go up to, you know, the ounce and an eighth, you go up to 400 or 545. Wow. If you go up to an ounce and a quarter, you're now up to 605. Just that quarter ounce adds, a, adds well, 120 pellets. Sure. Now, here's what I see the biggest failing is people go to Walmart and they buy the one ounce seven and a half. Right. 350 BBs, or pellets, I should say, in a one ounce cup. All right? Now you take the one ounce at seven and a half, and you go to a number nine at, s at an ounce and a quarter, you go from 350 to 605 pellets. Wow. So you're actually 108% more pellets in the ounce and a quarter, number nine, than the off-the-shelf one-ounce load that 90% of the shooters pick up to shoot. So all of a sudden, your odds of uh, breaking a frangible target on a stick someplace uh, have improved immensely. If I can double and, my and, chances? Right, and all, now, now you've got so much shot, now, now you can start playing games with actually expanding your pattern, which uh, improves your... Or, uh, expanding gives your, your aiming area. Yeah, expanding your uh, possible aiming area. In other words, improving your margin of error. And what does that mean? Well, now you don't have to be quite as precise. You can be faster, a little bit faster on the move. So it and, all the, and the top into, shooters, that's what makes a difference. Right. So you've got the guys that are trying to aim with their, their, ch their the full choked barrel with a one ounce number six shot. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, 15, 10 and 15 yards. It's the size of the clay. It's almost the size of the clay. Right, yeah. yeah years ago when I first got into this, and I was at a, the Three Gun Nationals down at Shreveport, and I was uh, engaging uh, some poppers, and I, I was running a modified choke, like an ounce and eighth at seven and a half. And I noticed that my pattern was like completely inside this popper at say like 15, 20 yards. <laughs> and then well, uh, it ripped it right and, down. And uh, a couple other top shooters were hosing these things down, and I started looking, and their their pattern was like totally off the plate, well dispersed. And I said, Ah! <laughs> so the light went on. I realized that my whole combination of choke and ammunition you know, made me have to shoot like a rifle at those type of targets. Right. And that was costing me a huge amount of time. You have to set up the choke and the ammo for not only every type of competition, but every stage. You have to go up and play with the different well, you concepts. Can, you well, can. there's different ways that you can orchestrate that application. Um, you can either change your, effect, your downrange effectiveness by either changing your chokes and using a single shot size. Right, stay with a seven and a half, but if you go from a full, or a, a improved cylinder choke to a full choke, your pattern goes from this to this. Correct. Or what we prefer to do is you keep a single choke. And we use five different kinds of And you use two or three different types of shot. The smaller pellets obviously have a greater surface area, so they slow down and disperse quicker in the air. They'll also have less, significantly less energy on target. Oh, significantly pellet. less. And let me get back. Well, we'll finish this and I'll get back okay. to my cheat sheet. And so you get the lighter pellets disperse quicker, right. but have less energy. The so the pattern heavier, gets bigger quicker. Correct. Then you have the heavier pellets, <coughs> which fly truer, meaning straighter, mm -hmm. and maintain their density with what you've got. So you get a, a tighter pattern at distance with the heavier shot. 
And significantly more energy. And more energy. And that was the part I want to go to. So here is an example of the energy differences. Uh, a number four shot okay. at 20 yards gives you seven and a half foot pounds of energy per pellet. All right. The seven and a half at 20 yards gives you 2.6 pounds of energy. So you have actually 40% less energy at 20 yards, the difference being a number four versus a number seven and a half. Right, but the number four you only get um, in but like an ounce load, you only get 135 pellets and correct. you get 350 on the seven and a half. That's correct. So how do you balance that? Well, it, it, part of it's experience. Um, and the, the third part of the equation is actually your barrel length. So you have shot size, choke size, and barrel length, and how to actually apply the shot that you select. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we decided to make the easy part of the video right now. Um, the, one of the problems with this type of conversation is, first of all, we're in a two-dimensional format. We've got a TV, and we're trying to show you three-dimensional concepts on it, and it's extremely difficult. Um, the other part is, you, a lot of these things, you might have a popper at 10 yards, at 12 yards, it might be a completely different kind of shot, or 14 or 15 yards. Every yard of difference with a, with a metal plate makes a huge difference. Correct. Um, as far as the effectiveness on target with the different loads. And that's if they calibrated the targets correctly. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, exactly. You never know what you're going to run into. Um, so personal experience as to shooting these different things really comes into play is, uh, okay, I know I can knock that over with this. Well, why? Because I did it in a match about three months ago and I used one of these or one of these and this gun. As long as the target's actually facing you and you're not glancing off, okay. trying, to, trying to be gamey, trying to engage mm -hmm. the target before the actual designated shooting area. There's so many variables that come up with shot size, dram equivalent, um, weight of the, of the actual shot load, the payload, then your barrel length, your choke, that it's almost impossible to give a well-rounded guess. But what I would look for, for most people who run a 21 to a 24 inch barrel is probably just as a generic idea of a starting point, either seven and a half or eights for clay type targets or plates that are 12 to 14 yards and less. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, with an improved cylinder choke. Correct. Okay, that's a good starting point for you out there just as you can go into Walmart and buy that kind of load. Now, I would also start with shooting the three plus dram loads, the three and a quarter dram. That the three will... dram might not work your gun and it's something to be, you know, to, to keep an eye out on and make sure that that stuff works, on, it functions in your gun. Correct. And yeah, a good point is too, like when you're practicing at home, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to buy various types of ammunition that you know are going to be available to you. For example, uh, typically uh, Walmart has... Walmarts are everywhere. Right. They, they have those uh, uh, 500 round... Bulk, no, the bulk packs. The 100 packs. 100, 100 packs of federal, like, ounce and an eighth, uh, three and a quarter gram field loads. And typically those, those things will operate your, your, your uh, gas rubber shotgun. And you might want to try various things that you know that you're going to be able to buy on the load and make sure, or on the road, and make sure those actually function in, in your shotgun. Right. Now, you know? those function in the 1100s well, mm -hmm. but in, like, my open Benelli with all the porting and all the other stuff that's done to it, they won't, they just, they're not quite that happy unless the gun's perfectly clean. Right, and, you, and that's what you have to know. Is and what you have to set up the your loads gun. for your gun. Exactly. And you've got to personalize them to your situation. And understand what affects your gun. I yeah, mean, right. you know, just going to a match and knowing that your gun's clean obviously will work more reliably. It's a lot more critical to have a clean shotgun than it is a handgun or a rifle. But everybody's always told me I... It's a shotgun. It's Who a cares? shotgun. It always works. Right. <laughs> and, and that's not true. You know, the guns we love to hate. <laughs> the guns we love to hate. That would be the title of the video. Um, I, I mean, shotguns have cost me more three-gun championships than anything until I went to the Benelli. I, I think I've got a stash of 1100s in the corner with broken parts on them. I've got one. I gave you one. I just left it there because I was so mad at that one. I didn't break it over anything. <laughs> it's collecting dust. Uh, but back to the ammo. Set yourself up. Figure out a slug that works for you. Figure out some shot that works for you. Get a good basic starting point to to work with and then go from there and learn about the other areas of the shotgun, you know, as far as whether it's nine shot, eight shot, seven shot, go shoot it on a target and see what the effects of that are with your different chokes because every one of those chokes is going to take that shot and do something different with it. 
on your length of barrel. Right. Now, I know we've said a lot of different things here, but I, I know we're going to get to the point where we're going to simplify it for, for our viewers and say that in most applications, we're going to choose one, two, and three right. type of shells. And typically, we'll see that a modified choke, again, depending on your preference. Now, I personally have selected the choke that shoots my slugs the best. Okay. I mean, to me, I need that, to know. You know what? I've set up my Benelli that way, too. The improved cylinder choke, not the cylinder, not the full, the IC is what that gun groups the best with slugs. Right. So I know that on my guns that I shoot my modified, my modified choke and my point of aim, point of impact for my slugs at 50 yards is point of aim, point of impact. I now select my shot to run with that choke in any application, so there's less for me to think about when I'm on the range. Right. Make it make your job easier off the bat mm -hmm. when you're just getting started yeah. by by figuring out a few things that work, stick to that, and then grow your experience base. Yeah, and it's about priorities too. Is what I, I, I talk to a lot of people who are obsessed with, say, getting the mildest possible recoil out of the shotgun, and that that really should not be the end all, be all. I mean, obviously, first off, the gun has absolutely got to work. And then, getting back to the slug thing, I'd like to think that the most difficult thing that you got to do with the shotgun is to shoot slugs accurately. Now, whether or not we should be having uh, 80 yard sh slug shots on a stage, that's a whole different argument, which I'm not going to get that's into here. Right? That's, that's right. But the fact is, if you have to do it, the gun and ammunition has to be able to perform that. And so then, if that becomes the, like you said, you're, you're obsessed with your slugs, your whole slug performance. And well, that, that, that was my criteria, too. It's the, the slug load that shoots accurately. Uh, I, everything else kind of trickles down from there because that's, that's the first thing I've got to be able to do is to shoot slugs with almost rifle accuracy, let's say, to be able to accomplish those most difficult shots because anybody can hit the birds on the sticks and knock over the steel, it's, but can you get that 75, 80 yard slug shot without having yeah, to make it up? Yeah, you want to you know. shoot it once, not right, exactly. how many boxes of shells will it take me to hit it. Now, next let's just get into the slugs and the definitions of the different parts of that. Let's take a look at the slugs in a little bit more detail. For our purposes, we're going to simplify it and talk about two basic types of, of slugs, which are the, the type of slugs that we'd be most, most likely to buy for our sport. You're going to find the slugs that incorporate a, uh, the, the lead portion on top of an attached polyurethane tail. And then there's other slugs where you've got the the slug itself, which is separated from the base wad. They're two separate pieces. Uh, two different th competing theories in accuracy, and uh, both of them work. Here you've got uh, two slugs. You can see that we're shooting them out of smooth bore barrels, and you've got to be able to spin stabilize them. So uh, as the, the barrels are not rifled, we see that the slugs have uh, fins or uh, what appears to be rifling on them. And as they're traveling down the barrel, that friction between the barrel and those veins actually start the slug spinning and air resistance against those will keep them spinning at once they leave the barrel. So now you've got a, st a spin stabilized uh, projectile. You notice this one is hollow underneath and uh, that gives it a weight forward, uh, dis weight dispersion and that also helps in, in increasing its accuracy. Here also there, uh, by putting this tailpiece on there, it's creating a resistance like a dart which uh, again uh, makes the slug travel in a, in a straight fashion and not tumble. Now both of these slugs are relatively inexpensive and they'll deliver typically oh, two to four inch accuracy at 50 yards which is adequate for what we're doing. That's really kind of a criteria that we're looking for. You've that's got to your, be able to, your demand on accuracy? Yeah, right. I would say that's somewhere between two to four inches at 50 yards, hopefully in the two to three inch range. Uh, in worst case scenario, I've seen team on team shoot offs where we've had to hit plates uh, like uh, 12 by 14 inch plates at 100 yards. Well, you, you also want to know uh, that your slug is going to be able to hold in that, that group size, say, at that distance. And, uh, and then, of course, it, it's be a question of where you're going to zero for your slugs and where your holdovers are if you happen to have to take a, a longer shot. Let's take another look at these. You notice that there's different heights on this brass. Now, at one point in time, that actually meant something. High brass, low brass, people started to talk about high brass shells as being high-powered hunting loads, low brass being target shells. Really not the case anymore. Now you can find full power slug loads that have shorter brass than, than what we call low recoil. And that brings us up to the next major distinction here. Uh, your full power slug loads 
like typically our one ounce to an ounce and a quarter of lead traveling at anywhere from 1400 up to 1600 feet per second, very high velocity, they generate a lot of recoil. We really don't need that for what we do. We're not trying to uh, have any performance on game. We're just trying to impact a target, make a hole, maybe knock over a piece of steel. So actually the, the newer, lower recoil slugs, which have typically one ounce projectiles traveling at about uh, 1200 to 1250 feet per second, uh, generating recoil is more similar to a trap load really, but yet giving pretty good, pretty good accuracy and uh, real good uh, recoil impulse manageability. So the, the goal is to find a slug that's about the same recoil pattern as the shot you're using most of the time. Probably. Exactly, and that also uh, doesn't come as a surprise. If you, typically, if you have to stage those loads up independently of your shot shells, and all of a sudden you have this 1,500 foot per second uh, butt kick and load in there, that is going to kind of disrupt your concentration on what you're, what oh, you're doing. Oh, that's actually so. what I shoot almost all the time. I shoot <laughs> full house slugs. And if you're used to it, yeah. Well, um, MGM. Yeah, at the MGM, if you don't shoot full house slugs, I mean, the reduced recoil stuff is, it's like a mortar round after about 60, 70 yards, you know, it just starts dropping like a rock. And the full house stuff makes it out to 90 to 100 significantly better. Because you don't have to worry about the whole sighting issue as much with those. You yeah. don't have as much of a trajectory loop on it. But that gets back to what we talked about earlier as far mm -hmm. as uh, ammunition specific to the application. We know that right. we go, go right. shoot certain right. recoil. And the gun and the mm -hmm. gun, but mm -hmm. at certain matches you need a certain performance of the ammunition and we know after shooting a few years up at the MGM that in order to spin the spinners and knock down the steel, if we're not shooting full house one ounce loads, we'll take, we, won't, we won't accomplish the task at hand. Right, and that's what you got to know, what, what, what you actually have to do with it and whether or not you can live with the low recoil slugs or whether or not you need the high velocity. Now the, um, the slug demands for myself uh, first thing I look at on the slugs, and uh, actually let's get a close up of this. If you take a look right here, you see how much distance there is between the plastic edge and the top of the slug. Now that's generally not that big of a deal depending on the type of gun you're running, but if you take it out and you slam it into the gun really hard, let's see if I can get it here, you see the, the deformation that happened really easily there with just a little bit of thumb pressure. And all of a sudden it might not chamber. Right, that might not chamber. Whereas this one here, I can, I can put a pretty good squeeze on it, but because of the, the placement of the slug mm -hmm. in the round, it doesn't deform as much. Um, the Remingtons, we'll take a look at that. That one deforms really easily, just like the Wolf. Um, so it's another concern to take a look mm -hmm. at as far as reliability. And uh, so, I mean, I've actually looked at using the Rangers, but the reduced recoil with the Rangers generally don't have enough oomph to work my open Benelli. Hmm. Uh, so what I do is uh, I, I actually use some of the seller and below stuff. I use some different stuff just depending on what hmm. I need to do for the job. I won't run any reduced recoil slugs so in the open we, gun. We actually set up our gun specifically to run these things because we know that's what a lot of people run. And for most of what we do... In a gas gun, that's right. easier. Yeah, exactly. In a gas gun, you can because it's not uh, dependent on the recoil impulse of the shell as, as much the port pressure, you can play a little bit more, you know, uh, you can play some games with that. And, and typically I've found that, like if I zero with these Remington managed recoil slugs which are around 1,250 feet per second, uh, about a six o'clock hold, maybe three inches over point of aim at 50 yards, uh, then all I have to do is say uh, with my bead, cover an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper at 100 yards, and that, that would be my, my trajectory, so then it's fairly simple. Okay, so your yep. first crossover point's 25 and it comes back in at like 90 to 100, or is it low there? Where does it yeah, do for I'm, your gun? I'm generally zeroing at, you know, taking a precision zero at 50 where the, it, the, the, the shotgun or my sight, it's printing it right above the bead, you know, which at uh, 50 I, yards. I, I'm, I'm estimating is a two, three inch uh, okay. over, you know, six o'clock over uh, the bead being underneath my point of impact, see? And then for that, tactical. That, right, for, for, tactical for my tactical indeed. shotgun, right. Now, where do you slug when you use a dot on an open, or where do you sight when you use a dot on an open gun? Do you zero at 50 yards, 75 yards, 25 yards? It's been so long since I've shot open. <laughs> I honestly can't. I would, I would probably, you know, uh, I would probably end up doing the same thing. I'd probably give myself uh, uh, two, three inches over dot at 50 yards because I know that that point of that POA works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, then gives me a realist, a, a very easy hold off, even if I have to shoot out to 100. In fact, I found it like 75 to 80. I'm still holding dead on with it. Yeah, um, that's actually. I was just 
yeah. asking because uh, on the dot side, I use your J point on the Benelli, right. and I, I generally zero at 50, um, and it works out to about three inches over over where the dot sits. I use one of those big yeah. uh, shoot and see targets, mm -hmm. and because the ball just about covers that perfectly, <laughs> and that dot or the the uh, slugs are hitting at the top of the dot, mm -hmm. which is great, you know, because you know exactly where they're going. They're, they hit the they rub the top edge of the dot. Um, so down to like 25 yards, you're hitting the bottom edge of the dot. Mm -hmm. And then out at 75 yep. yards, your dot's getting bigger, yep. and you're hitting inside of it. And out at 100, you're hitting down to the bottom of it. Right. And so it's a very simplistic way to work with a sight in on an open gun. You know, and it's amazing how many uh, entry-level shooters will show up without even having a slug zero on their gun. Well, they usually slow, show up without slugs. Yeah, with <laughs> Well, you, you know, they, they don't even know to bring them <laughs> well, or, the other, or have tested them or anything. Well, the other but, surprising thing you'll see all the time is they'll, they're on the line loading their gun, and as an example on the Benelli, it holds seven rounds, but they can only get six in the tube. Right. Because the slugs are the, slightly different. The slugs, take, right. take a look at this here. That's a good example there. Um, there's, you've, you've got three different slug loads with different heights right there, and look at your standard shot. Now, once you stack up six or eight of these, that's, that little difference in height there starts making a big difference in how many rounds your gun can hold. Right. And T so people never check it. Right. Yeah, typically one less round, you know, per fully loaded gun is, is a result of that offset between, say, standard two and three quarter inch shot loads versus slug loads, which use a roll crimp and always end up being a bit, a bit longer. But it's something to check right. before you get to the match as opposed to saying, oh, look, yeah. it's a seven round stage. I can only get six in my gun. Well, or people are planning on their reloads and they go, okay, start with seven or eight. They start with eight rounds, okay. And then on position two, I'm gonna load four rounds on the way over there. And they go up to load and it messes up their mental game because they can only get seven in the gun. Correct. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've been doing that kind of math as uh, through <laughs> the stage when I, well, I can't count anymore. <laughs> All right. Um, watch out for your slugs. I mean, as a quick overview, first find slugs that work your gun. Whether the, if the low recoil ones will work that and you're happy with their performance, great. Find out which ones will group. Then find out which choke will group your slugs the best. Yeah, just the diff you, I, I went through four different modified chokes on my Benelli and found one that worked better with my sighting system than another. On, on, on the exact same size of choke? Same manufactured choke. Wow. Another thing, when you put your choke tubes, tubes in, you want to make sure that the choke tube index is up at the same position in your barrel because that torque actually causes that choke tube to distort. You know, we over torque it or under torque it, well, now all of a sudden, the position of the, the, the concentricity of the tube relative to the bore and how it distorts in there is going to change your accuracy and your ability to shoot the slugs at the same point of impact. And also, cleaning your gun, yeah. uh, the, the plastic, the wad buildup <laughs> yeah. in your barrel, that can get in the back of the choke tube or in the base of the the reamed area for right. the choke, and that can alter your choke position too. Yeah, I hate to Here's say it, another fun one. Yeah. Tighten these down. Right. Uh, and, it, and if you don't have the barrel tube loose right here and you tighten this down, you'll actually change the impact point of the, right. of the slugs also. Yeah, you've got to make sure that this clamp goes in exactly the same place and with exactly the amount of the same tension every time. Right. But it, it just goes to show that it's a game of details. And this has probably you know? got more details <laughs> right. than your pistol, which we've been shooting for right. years. Right, you got one, one type right, of ammo. Rifle's almost easy, but you get to the shotgun, which everybody perceives as, well, it's a shotgun. It's a shotgun. Learn how to reload. Words. Right. Oh. There, there's more technical details that can affect the fun factor at the range. Yeah. Oh, we could probably actually talk for an easy eight to ten hours on ammo. But I got an idea. Let's move on to <laughs> actually equipping the guns because, I mean, this is something that shooters, you really need to go out and nail it down yourself and figure out what it takes for you, your gun, your load combination to do the job. And it comes through experience and a lot of work and, and quite a bit of money spent on ammo. Yeah, experimenting and you know, we'll get down and, and make a few recommendations that will get you started at the range that'll work 99% of the time. Right. Okay, so we're gonna move on to equipping the guns and the shooter with all the different accessories. <laughs> One of the more critical components of your shooting for shotgun competitions or for real world work is figuring out and setting up your equipment for the right task at hand. In the competition stuff, we've got uh, one special class at several of the matches called Heavy Metal at the uh, JP Rocky Mountain Three Gun World Championships. What are the rules for that class? 
That would consist of pump shotgun, 12 gauge only, uh, eight plus one, as far as eight rounds in the magazine, one in the chamber, that'd be the. Okay, is there a barrel length limitation on that? Uh, I'll tell you the truth, I honestly don't know if they but I'm pretty sure it's the same as, as what the tactical shotgun would be, which is a 22 inch, uh, you know, maximum. Okay, and then in, um, you've got uh, limited shotgun and open shotgun. Limited falls under the categories of both limited and USPSA and tactical scope. Or Correct. Or tactical irons. They'll all be grouped into the same thing, but the shotgun stays the same pretty much throughout all yeah, the Yeah, 22 inch overall length barrel. Okay. Uh, eight plus one, eight rounds in the magazine, one in the chamber, so nine, nine rounds total in the gun. That you can only ever load nine rounds in the gun. Area of controversy. A lot of the matches are saying you can only start with nine rounds. Okay. Do they have a limitation as to how far the magazine extension tube can go past the barrel? A lot of it's carried over from the previous SOF rules being the magazine can extend one inch past the end of a 22 inch barrel. So you have 23 inches of length of barrel or magazine extension total kind of thing. Correct. Okay, so you could actually on those, you could get more rounds in the gun than you're officially allowed yeah, to start Yeah, in the with. Benelli with a 22 inch barrel and a magazine configured one inch past the barrel, you can get uh, nine in the magazine itself. Right, and then one on the carrier if you've got a modified carrier. No, the old style carriers will allow you to do that, and that's not a recommended practice from Benelli. That's one thing people need to know. It's not a designed feature. That's just a idiosyncrasy of the operating principle of the gun. Okay, oh, we, call it, uh, we call it ghost loading. Just, just to cover that really quick, where's my Benelli? Here. Here, we'll use mine. Okay. Um, what it is, you've loaded up your tube. This, this tube actually holds 10 rounds. And you take the bolt before you put a round in the chamber or anything else, and you drop a round down onto the carrier, kind of flush it down there, and then put another round above it. And you got to kind of kind of tricky to get it in there just right sometimes. Typically it happens right or it happens wrong. That either, yeah. Repeatedly. So if you got it wrong, just cycle it back out, drop the round back in there. Usually if you let the bolt about halfway forward, there you go. There we go. And so it, it'll, it'll fire this round, it'll cycle and pick up the next round without kicking another round out of the tube. Correct. Yeah, one of the design features of the gun is you can actually empty the chamber without emptying the magazine. Right, you can actually do this to do changes from slug to shot. Correct, if that's the way you're gonna do is select slug drill. Right, um, to actually kick around out of the tube, you have to hit the button. Correct. To change it up around. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Button, bolt release, silver, shell release. That's the way I remember it. Okay. Button, bolt release. Silver is the shell release. Correct. Now when the shell release is clicked, nothing's if, going in the button, yeah, just you, as a little. If you hit the you hit the bolt release again. Oh, okay. It releases that. Okay. Um, just a little side note there. Uh, the um, limited guns, eight plus one, generally to start, check the individual rules for the match you're going to and for the division you're going to compete in to set up the guns right. Make sure you don't have anything that'll bump you into the next division. Right. And at the moment, they all vary. There's not one unified ruling organization. Yeah. The whole sport is in evolution, you know? Yeah. So SOF started it, and now yeah. it's snowballing into the... Right. They're, they're, a lot of their rule, their, their uh, criteria was carried forward, and uh, ultimately, like USPSA adopted the whole idea of tactical optics so that, because uh, the vast majority of trigger gun shooters were shooting that class, and they weren't able to shoot in USPSA without being bumped up into open. Into so, open class. So now we got kind of like one big roof that uh, supposedly will house all uh, trigger gun interests. Right, because the, <laughs> like the tactical scope, the only difference on a tactical scoped rifle versus an open rifle is a bipod. Bipod and one optic only, yeah. One optic only, right. yeah, you can have an iron sight side set, yeah. that's it. Um, and, but the shotgun, no ports, no comps. But it's uh, interesting that SOF did allow bipods in that um, class yes. for the last several years. Yeah, but years. You could, if yeah. you showed up with an open gun, you'd have been thrown off the range. Oh, uh, more than that. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably beaten with a stick, too. What was that about the pink base pads? Oh, we yeah. find them offensive. I think they actually <laughs> threw somebody out for that, didn't they? Um, in open, you can run anything you want. Uh, in USPSA versus the IMG rules are actually different. And the rules vary even in open just on magazine length or amount of rounds in the gun. 
you generally get 10 plus 1 in open for USPSA, uh, but for the IMG type events, mm -hmm. International Multi-Gun, you might be able to start with as many as you want. But you have to have that same configuration throughout the entire match. So if you have a 16 round gun that's six and a half feet tall, <laughs> you know, that's great until you get to the stage with the walls and the ports and you go try to feed it into them and you can't exactly run around and you do like I did one time with the, the skis through the door trick. The port was just inside the wall. And I ran up, got the gun a little turned a little early and proceeded to just about completely flip over the rifle or the shotgun. Um, we, I recovered. I would like to have seen that. I, I would have too, um, from another perspective. Uh, <laughs> and uh, pulled it out, shot that, and I was running up the steps, and the RO had a hard time keeping up with me because he was laughing so hard. <laughs> and so I asked, I, I of course had to tease him about getting a reshoot for being ridiculed yeah, during the ridiculed event. Ridiculed by officials. Um, the next thing you got to look at for your guns is setting up a sighting system that works for your eyes. and. You might be able to work with ghost rings, you might be able to work with a notch and post, a bead might work fine for you, or in the open guns you can go to actually a full-blown dot system. Um, now this is a, is a true glow system? Uh, these are Williams fire sights. Williams fire sights, okay. They got an uh, orange dot up front, two green in the back, very, very visible in, in daylight. I, I kind of like them. See if we can see Plus, what they do give you a really precise sight picture too when you get that bead in the, into the U-notch. And it's fully adjustable too. Fully adjustable, right. Okay, the only thing you'd want to make sure of is you get a set of sights like this that picks your sights off the rail is to set the gun up so you got your head on the stock. Right. You don't end up floating behind it. So I see you've got a higher comb on Yep, I, that's why I put okay. this in. Rem this is an option from Remington. We, we offer these stocks that they have this high comb and that actually works out. For most people, work out pretty well with this sight, sight uh, radius on there. Now this is actually a basic shotgun or the, the limited shotgun available from JP Enterprises, right? Yeah, it's, it's as we're converting an 1187 Sportsman, you know, to fit the criteria of those rules and and what we feel maxi maximize performance of the gun for that class. Okay. Because like I was saying before, one of the things is that you need to be able to shoot slugs accurately and so uh, you have to have some kind of adjustable rifle type sight on it rather than just shooting the plain rib. Yeah, with a bead on the right. end. Um, yeah, the, uh, the adjustability of the sights is very critical. On the Benelli, these are a fixed sight, but you can actually adjust for windage on them. Only adjustable for windage. Now, you can, in theory, adjust it for elevation a little bit by doing a little bit of file job on the front sight. Correct. <laughs> Not that I'm sure nobody's ever done that yeah, before. Yeah, this is, well, I was lucky. This was actually set up for point of aim, point of impact at 50 yards. Okay. So the heights were actually adjusted by uh, the people that built the barrel for me. Okay. And then this is a Benelli setup for a limited gun? Correct. No porting, no scope? No porting, nothing fancy, just your basic 22 inch, which is not a standard barrel as we mentioned earlier. I know, earlier. I know. Um, and so that's, that's the basic setups for those. Now in open class, you're allowed to basically do anything you want inside of a set of given parameters. You usually get 10 plus one. This one will actually hold 12 because it'll trap one on the carrier. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, You've got the, obviously, the J-point sights on these, so you could set them in. Or any slopes. optic you might want to put on there. Any optic yep. you might want to put on there. The problem is if, if you mount one of, like, the, you know, the Tascos, the Seymours, and that kind of thing, it tends to set the scope up about an inch and a half, two inches. R really slows me down. Well, it, yep. it slows me down, but in order to get any type of contact with your head to the stock, you have to have this cheek piece. That's yeah, we were talking about that. I had one, too, about two inches high off the stock. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, they're actually available at the, the trap ranges if right. you want to get one. Um, these are the uh, tech loader wells. This one's from Aerodondo Accessories. It actually goes around the tech loader loading gate device mm -hmm. uh, for using the speed loaders. And uh, then we've got you know, the extended safeties and all that stuff, um, soft butt pad, and of course, you've got to have porting of some type or some type of compensator. Because uh, you know, if we can take some of the kick out of these guns, that's even better. Let me just take a second mm -hmm. and talk about this. If, you, if in the open class, it's really important not to over tighten these screws because you're replacing the, uh, in some cases, you're replacing the uh, original pins, where, like with the bracket, with screws. And if you oh, over, right over tighten yeah. them, it pinches the receiver, and then of course uh, that'll bind up your trigger mechanism. Yeah, the same thing on the Benelli's. Um, you can actually pinch the receiver enough. Mm -hmm. Remember the friction thing that Mark was mm -hmm. talking about, and you'll cause a bind and lock the bolt up. Right or just enough to slow the bolt down a little tiny bit. Uh, let's get on to uh, talking about the, the one thing we haven't seen here, because we don't have one actually on the set, 
is the pistol grip stocks. Mm -hmm. And the only place I've ever seen a benefit for them was if you keep the gun shouldered while you're reloading. Yeah, there's uh, the, the biggest advantage is w once you develop your shooting style and your reloading technique, and this is what I tell people when I talk to them, um, everybody's a little bit different. We're all different size frames. I'm a little heavier up top. You know, John's a little bit slighter build. You're taller, but again, there's quite a bit of you. Um, <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way, I know. you know, but you've got mass there in your upper body. So on, like on the 1100 series guns, um, it's a fairly heavy gun. Right. If you don't have a pistol grip for that second, uh, second lever, uh, point of leverage, you've got to have some pretty good wrist strength and forearm strength to hold it in up. In order to manage it in yeah. a, in a and, shouldered I mean, position. This being, a, you know, a Benelli, it's, again, it's probably about as he heavy as a standard 1100, um, but it takes quite a bit of effort to keep the gun shouldered and then to sit here and load from underneath. Right, because some of the reload techniques are left hand, or excuse me, weak handed Correct. reloading techniques where the gun stays shoulder strong hand, they'll come up with four shells. Correct. And throw the shells. It can be extremely effective if you have the strength and your gun set up to do that. Right. But the, the, the disadvantage on the Benelli is it's a second point of contact, kind of if you think about the base of a pyramid where all the force starts in the receiver and is transmitted backwards. Okay. With the pistol grip being down here, you can actually hold the gun a lot tighter and when you start shooting it, you can uh, take energy out of the recoil operation and actually lock up the gun. Right, that is one of the interesting things about the Benelli that most people don't know is you can actually almost, well, sometimes, depending on how the gun's Depending done, on the uh, load selection. And how heavy the load is, you can jam the gun by being behind it too stiff. Mm -hmm. right. uh, whereas on an 1100, that helps. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's different platforms it's different with platforms. different things, and you've got to learn the ways they work. In the open gun shooting, we use a, or I use a uh, tech loader pouch like this from 3-Gun Gear, ironically enough. Um, one of the things about these is they're, it puts a lot of weight into this pouch. Now this holds six tubes, four rounds in each. Ends up weighing a lot, and uh, one of the things it's going to have Mark show us here real quick. Let's show you how to do this properly. Yeah, if you I, don't put these on right for the thigh pouches or the leg pouches. They can pull off, yeah, which so, people have done. So this part actually goes towards your body. Okay, so you use the long, long piece towards long your body. Long tab underneath the belt. Okay. You belt right around so it's sticking straight up and then rotate it Force underneath. It over. So the Velcro actually is captured against your body. Okay, because I was actually at a match over in uh, North Carolina and, and had the thing come undone on my left side Slide as I was running. And it was really kind of a cool fountain effect with uh, speed loaders. Another yard sale. <laughs> yeah, and you're, and, and you're picking stuff up while holding your shotgun, trying to chase after it. It's, <laughs> and I think if I can find it, I'll put it on this video. Um, then you just click it into place, lock it around your leg. I like running it pretty much in a right-handed or strong side dominant position for the loads. Uh, one of the other little tricks I use is to take and these are all along the same level, um, which is okay for some events, but if I've got like a couple of critical loads I have to do on a stage, I'll put a round or two inside of here. To lift it up. To lift it up a bit. And then generally I'll actually run the, uh, the red handles the ones I've got with the extra little tabs sticking out, the Arredondo tabs, I'll run those up on top and ones without the red tabs underneath because the red tabs can have a tendency to catch the handle above it and then you pull two out. Mm. So, you know, I'll run, a, I'll run an empty one there. Just in case I come down a little low, grab this one, it'll give me less of a chance of ripping the wrong one out. Sure. Now, you might notice a little modification I made on here. This is painted orange and the other ones are black or, yeah, all, these, all the rest of these are black. And the reason for that is I'll take these and in the orange ones I'll put in slugs, um, which I can also take and run on the left side if I want to. And then I'll leave the gun shouldered, load with the left side for the slugs at the end of a stage. Do you ever run different shot? Well, I, I'll run different shots. Sometimes I'll run heavier stuff in the orange ones. Um, the other tricky part is, like say you've got one slug right at the end of the stage, what you can also do is make the first or last round in the tube, or, uh, in, the, in the tech loader tube, a slug. And know that that's the last one you load on the stage for whatever target you've got to go shoot. As long as you don't lose count. Well, it's not necessarily losing count. 
has knowing where you are. Um, and we'll talk more about the reloading stuff later. Uh, this uh, Aerodondo piece works pretty well. And they work great, yeah. Okay, so we don't lock those down too hard. Now we're going to move on to how to put shells on other places on the gun. <clears throat> Probably the, the biggest area of question is how do you carry shells and where do you carry them? Unfortunately, there's no one hard, fast rule. It, there's no right answer. There's, there's no right answer. There's 15 different ways to right. reload. Um, my one answer is the closer to the loading gate, the shorter the transition, the easier it is to reload. Okay. So the way I run my, uh, my shotgun is I'll run with a side saddle mm -hmm. so that as I'm loading, I'll come up and I'll bring the gun to this position. So you're rolling to a 45 degree. Rolling okay. to 45. And again, just snapping up. Right. Now, and at this position, you've got an entire arm right. band available. And then and I've got another these. eight rounds here. Right. Now, these are actually um, uh, O rounds. Yeah, or the, the original name for this was the uh, Oh Shit 2 pack. Because. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Especially on a Benelli. On any gun. You yeah. know, you, you come up on your last target, and it's like, wow. And the gun's locked open. The gun's locked open. Come up. Right, you got your gate open. Drop it in, and that's going. That's why it's called the oh shit two. All wrong, right. right there, isn't it? <laughs> well, you still had. You still had some yeah, I was going to say if it's the bottom, the gun would have to actually be empty to yeah, do it. Yeah, if I'm in, if I'm actually sliding, there you lock, go. Come in, drop it in, hit it, and I'm back on target. Now, if you if you actually work on getting that down, you can actually. Um, you can actually get quite quick at it. Yeah, and and that's one of those times that that little extended button is actually beneficial if you have a tendency to hose yourself up. Sure. Because you can actually take, throw it, punch the button, and stay, and stay on and you your never, shoulder. And you never get off the gun. Yeah. That's the advantage um, to those. Because it can sure add an extra five seconds to the end of the stage for that one shell really quick. Oh, very quickly. Uh, the um, other options you got over here? Well, again, it, it gets back to your gun configuration, your individual dexterity, and your individual bo upper body strength. Okay. Um, some people, they like to load from the belt. Again, you're increasing your transition distance. That seems, yeah, that's a long move for one okay. shell. But some people, they can't support the gun, and so they'll load down here. Okay. All right. Now, on the Benelli Nova, the gate actually stays, I guess, in the up position, and okay. it's got a much longer area here. Okay. And so you can set a shell in there, take another shell behind and it. And actually put in two at a time. Put in two at a time, yeah. Um, so there's, you know, off the belt, and if you're, if you're loading up here, there's a long transition distance. Right. If you're loading from here, the shorter transition distance is better. Um, the, again, the closer you keep shells to the loading gate, the better. Okay. Um, the side saddles, originally started them making just an eight round side saddles for the Benelli's. The gas guns are not weight restricted, so we've ended up going and making as large as an 11 and 12 round side saddle for the guns. Okay. Now the only limitation is your hand position. So here you can see that if I'm holding the gun correctly, or close to being correctly, I can't get shells on the right hand side of the gun here. Right. On a gas gun, you've got a significantly longer forend, and so you can, the guys load the guns up more. On the off, on the ejection port side, and also on the receiver side. Okay. Okay, John, do you have uh, anything to add on the side saddle area? Sure, I've got one of uh, Mark's side saddles too, and I've uh, had some really good success with that. Uh, I also like to use it in case you've got one of these stages where you've got to uh, stage up a slug someplace, and that allows me to keep my slug ammunition separated from everything else, which I tend to carry in these these caddies on my belt. And so, uh, like Mark says, the whole loading and the whole ammo management becomes a real individual thing. And uh, uh, that's another use for this, is uh, uh, to separate out uh, various types of ammunition. Yeah, you can actually, uh, one of the benefits of that little two-pack on the side here, you mm -hmm. can put two slugs there. Right. Um, I generally don't like splitting the side saddle up with slugs and shot. You know, some guys, the first four are slugs for no, the end of the stage. too confusing. <laughs> well, the, the problem is if you get into a stage and you go load a slug at the wrong point and you shoot a metal target, you're going to be DQ'd. Right. If it's, you know, a short-range target built for shot. Or you'll get a 60-second penalty. Right. That, that, or, that's a chance you just can't afford to take, you know. Right. So keep those ammo areas separate and know where that ammo is coming from. Uh, one of the little tiny ammo features that you can do is you'll notice that the ammo here 
is two different colors. Uh, it's an easy way if you can find a slug that has a different colored hull than your shot shells that works for your guns, you can very easily just uh, keep them separated for your brain patterns too. So you know if you grab the wrong round, you go, oh, and you can just throw it on the ground and forget about it. Yeah, the color is the best way. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the manufacturers use similar colored shells. And I've seen people use uh, large uh, felt tip markers and put an X on the base of the case. So as they're actually looking up at the case here, there'll be a big black X or something on there, and that'll indicate, a, in some cases, a slug. Some type of marking on it. Yeah. So that's a way to get around that. Uh, um, the way I like is just keeping them in independent areas. That's my preference. You know, if I've got, uh, if I've got a whole tube or two of slugs, I'll keep them on my left side and all the shot on the right side. Um, you can run an armband with slugs, but on the gun you're going to have shot or something like that so you don't get them mixed up and go the wrong way. Correct. Yeah, and I like to think of like primary, secondary, and tertiary sources of ammo too. Like you said, like your primary source might be closest to your, to your loading gate and then uh, my transition to these in the side and finally I'll, if I got a high round count stage I'm going to be wearing one of your bandoliers and that's going to be my final source if things sure. really go to hell. Yeah, there's almost like a hierarchy <laughs> of where you keep your ammo. Exactly. You know, for me right. I go, you know, either the arm carrier and the side saddle or side saddle and arm carrier and then to the bandolier and then down to a belt. That way the shells are always oriented. Mm -hmm. They're in a position where you're familiar where, where they're at and you don't have to think about loading them. All right. Now for uh, the guys that do the, that have the big meat hook hands and they can actually reload four rounds at a time. Um, they'll come up off the belt. Now this is a, uh, a loader or a load carrier from uh, progressivemachine.net and just clicks onto the belt and locks into place. And all you do is you grab those rounds and then you come up one, two, three, four. Now I personally haven't trained that. That's why I use tech loaders and shoot open. Yeah. It's a very effective technique if you're able to do it. Right, and it takes a significant amount of training to do it. So we're not going to really focus on that kind of an area. I mean, just the, the roll over, load off the arm is almost as fast, um, but it's got a lot less of a chance to screw up. I mean, you blow this, and you've got three or four rounds laying on the ground, and you've got to go find some more to put into the gun. Right. I, you know, keeping it simple. Um, until you start and develop the techniques, or you start developing the style of reloading that works best for you, and then, I mean, realistically, off the belt like that is more of an advanced reloading technique. Oh, it's it's hugely advanced and it requires, I mean, probably 50 or 100 hours of really serious right. dedication. And the guys that are good at it are extremely good. Right, right. and they've dedicated massive amounts of time to getting there right. Um, now you've got the the belt system here. This is the uh, where is it at? Here it is. Bandler. Yeah. Yeah, again, uh, we tried to make everything modular so it works, you know, everything's compatible. Well, um, sometimes, like at the Iron Man, you have, to, you have to carry... I'll carry two of these, and this is 32 rounds. Uh, yeah, so it's 64 rounds just on your chest. Yeah. So... Um, um, there's a reason they call it the Iron Man. Yeah. So in this position, again, it's across your chest, close proximity to the loading gate. Roll the gun. Roll the gun either left-handed, right-handed, and the shells are oriented, secure. Plus, it's kind of like a mono spender. It helps keep your belt up. <laughs> yeah, when you got the rest of that weight down. <laughs> when you got everything else on your body. Now, um, um, are there any other options you've got over here? Well, for you know, it, it, it's almost endless what we've come up with with, with requests from the customers and, and such. Uh, you know, combination two packs where you have a, a two pack, of two plus two, where this is a, probably one of the only accessories on the fore end for the Benelli because you still allow, you know, hand space. Um, Just watch with your Benelli, making sure the thing's going to work with the, ex the extra weight on it. Friction. Yeah. Get rid of the friction. friction. You can almost load these things up. Uh, again, this is a 2 plus 4. We've done the 2 plus 6s, the 2 plus 8s. Again, on a, uh, on a gas gun, you can mount this in the necessary position. You still have plenty of room at the front of the forend. Um, it's all mix and match, whatever works for the individual. It, right. It's it hard fits to your body style and, and your, fits your body style. style. And then, uh, I haven't seen you put any on your hat yet. Last resort. Mm -hmm. Last resort. And then uh, something that's become popular is uh, the chest carriers, where it holds 24 rounds. The other biggest question I get all the time is, how much ammo do I need to carry? My answer is, how often do you plan on missing? 
It's the right answer. Well, a right question, actually. Yeah, so most stages that uh, the average match run 16 to 24 rounds, usually two to three complete loads. Well, if you've got nine in the gun. Nine in the gun. You might have eight on the side. Eight on the side. And then you've got eight on your arm, or right. 16. 16, that gives you 24 rounds. I have, I always carry at least eight for fumble factor. At least eight extras? Yeah. Okay. Um, I know on the speed, uh, on the tech loaders, you never know if things are always going to go right. Mm -hmm. Just like anything, Murphy factor. Sure. I always make sure that I have at least two to three additional speed loaders if there's three required on the stage. If there's six loads or eight loads like the Iron Man, I'll have mm -hmm. 10 or 12 on me. Um, sometimes the Iron Man, I've actually used 12 to 14 on a stage when I, oh, gosh, yeah. when, when you run up to a table. Right. You know, you go do 14 speed loads in a stage, it's... And, 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 that, <laughs> and that's an interesting thing is actually some, <laughs> matches, some matches require that you actually pre-station your rounds. Right. So How you, to position your ammunition. Yeah. People don't, a lot of people don't think about that. They don't, they don't go and they, they'll just, okay, well, you know, I, I need some, I need some rounds laying there. And that's, they'll just lay them out there instead of, if, if you're used to loading rounds two at a time, Set them up so you can grab them two at a time. Grab them in pairs. or Grab, grab them in pairs, pairs, grab them in quads, whatever, sure. or three, whatever you learn to yeah. train with, set it up that and way. And that's probably some stuff we'll go over when we do the, the drills and, and the practices. Which, know yeah. which way you want your case heads orientated, all that. Correct. Absolutely. Um, any other things that come up on this stuff? Well, you know, again, everything's different. You know, we do the, uh, the arm carriers. We do an eight shell. We do a five shell. And then our, our new ones that we're coming out with are 16 shell. And I've actually oh. done, I've done one for one customer that was actually a 20 shell. Two He's got big arms? Big guy. <laughs> anyway, so it, it's kind of <coughs> lim limitless what we've come up with as far as how to carry shells. There's no right way, and I recommend people start off simple. Get out to the matches. Take a couple of boxes of ammo with you. Work your way through the problems and see what you think might work right. for you. Try, uh, try some things Try out. something, you know. There's no one right answer. Yeah, that's... Um, that's one thing a lot of people get stuck in is they think there's absolutely a right way to do it. And then you look at like the top three or four limited guys. One of them's loading four rounds right hand. One's loading four rounds left hand. Um, one's loading off a chest carrier. One loads off chest carrier and Voight loads off of his arm. Right. And so there's, you know, it's whatever fits you. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're um, all different body types. Right. And, and so uh, obviously body type isn't a factor in becoming a top shotgun shooter, which is kind of neat. Because most people would think that would be with the way the guns recoil and the way they're Right. Their technique is, but hopefully uh, the shooting part of this program is going to help people out with that. Uh, I noticed you got a couple of other little oh, accessories. Oh, well, you know, here. some things that are out on the market. This is, um, it's see. a, I guess you call it a universal choke. It'll, it'll change from cylinder to full. Okay. And, and you, just, uh, you just screw it and down. It, it That's literally, it. you know, just uh, replaces the factory choke. It's a, it's a finger mechanism that squeezes down or opens back up. Right. Um, the only tricky part might be just keeping it clean. Uh, yeah, like many shotgun accessories, you know, this just replaces the factory choke. Now, does is that considered a barrel extension? That's a. I mean, it's a question <laughs> when you get to a match. This is what people are doing. Check check with the match director. Because of the ben Benelli's are a 21 inch barrel, you're allowed to have a 22 inch barrel with a magazine extension that's one inch past the barrel. Right. To date, I know of, they're using extended chokes to allow for increased barrel length. Okay, but is a choke considered part of the barrel or not? It's something to make sure That's you ask at the competition mm -hmm. you're at. Right. So if you have a, a, a longer choke or something with the, with the maximum length on the barrel in the first place, you screw that thing on, they don't walk up and go, oh, you're an open class or you're DNF'd. Right. But then, you know, the caveat to that is some chokes are just longer chokes. So you can't ding somebody right. for having a different manufactured choke right. that actually sits externally to the barrel. Actually, you can't. Really? They will. You never know what will happen. Well, yeah, there. I guess that's true. Opinions do vary, and even though some people might be wrong, they still... Right. I mean, oh, are you shooting the match with that? Well, then we consider that part of the barrel. That's the overall length of the barrel. Correct. You never know what, what way it'll go. So ask first sometimes right. before you do things. It's right. a lot easier than getting sent home early well, and being a donation to the prize see, table. And that's one of the reasons, I think, why at the SOF, you know, a lot of people, you know, really didn't like some of the things they did, but they decided to take a real hard line on stuff in order to avoid this creep. Otherwise, you have this creeping effect of, of every, you know, if you give them a fudge factor pretty soon. That's why yeah. I like open. <laughs> 
There's no creep. There's right. no creep. What do you want to do? Okay. Do <laughs> Good luck. Um, there's a couple of matches that we've been to where we've shot in dark houses. Right. And and they and they provide you with a flashlight. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. But yeah, that's true. We, we we've got all our guns set up where we have we are able to illuminate them in some fashion. Okay. So again, this is just a uh, this is a aftermarket flashlight uh, adapter mm -hmm. that works with the uh, the M3 lights that uh, Insight work. Insight technology. Nice. Insight technology um, that work the same with the uh, the ARs mm -hmm. and some of the pistols. And you just slide that onto over the barrel ex or the magazine tube. This would go over the magazine tube, and then as you can see. I can't fit it on because it's tightened down, but I actually already have it set up with Velcro. Okay. For uh, that would sit up here. Hmm. That's a pretty slick little way of working around it. Well, it's stuff you carry with your bag because, especially in the three-gun matches, you never know. What you they're never do. know what they're going to do to you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a couple years ago at the uh, the uh, Superstition Mountain, there was a lot of people running around borrowing flashlights for that one that one stage. Duct tape, <laughs> right. Right. Duct rubber tape. bands. <laughs> Yeah. Whatever it took to mount a light on your gun. At the cavalry arms match last year, I duct taped a, uh, a surefire to my hat <laughs> because you actually changed guns in the dark house thing sure. or something like that. You had to swap back and forth. So if you tied it onto one gun, and you go to the handgun, you're standing there going, where are the targets? Because you can't see anything at all. Right. So, you know, shotgun is just, it's an evolving area where there's a lot of flexibility, but each individual has a lot of variables that they need to identify for themselves. Okay. Now, uh, John, like a lot of the middle-aged shooters out there, you wear glasses. When people have a tendency to hit the 40, 45-year-old age bracket, almost everybody gets glasses. It's all downhill from there. Yeah. You know, and I, you told me you have like four different pairs. Yeah, I, in fact, within the last couple of years, I've become obsessed with my vision because I realize it's, it's getting worse right. almost by the month. You and know? you can only shoot as fast as you can see. That's so right. if you can't see... Yeah, my, my business is visual acuity, and, and uh, that is a big part of shooting. And we got to wear glasses anyway, so that's why I decided not to go with the LASIK. I might as well have several pairs of glasses tailored for different things. And, and of course, as you get older, you realize that your vision is starting to recede out. I'm naturally nearsighted, so my vision, my distance vision, I don't have that either, but now right. it's receding out, so actually that window starts collapsing, gets, getting shorter and shorter. So I, I decided to have uh, a set of glasses made up to improve my ability to shoot optical sights. So, like, uh, you mean scopes, scopes? Scopes on rifles, you know, for, for, for precision rifle, I thought. Because okay. I knew that I, my vision, you know, was uh, not as good as it, it has had been, and so I wanted to see how, just how good they could tweak it. So I got, I got a little bit better than 2020 out of them. I was able to start reading the stuff beyond the, the bottom line on the chart, and that enabled me. I had to reset up all my optics, you know, adjust the, the oculars, but it gave me really improved resolution of the reticle into the target, say. Okay. So that was something I was after. But on the downside, these glasses are worthless for shooting like iron sights on a pistol or anything that's uh, uh, shorter than my arm. Right, because the focal length that sets right. you up for is, right. is incorrect for seeing something mm -hmm. at this distance. So on the other hand, I got a set of glasses I had made up with my right eye, they call it monovision, oh. where, where my left eye is focused for the distance and my right eye is focused on my front sight, on my pistol. And that actually enables me to get pretty good acuity and much better speed and accuracy with my handgun shooting iron sights than, than I used to. Right. I tried, I tried a set of glasses like those once, and I think I walked into the wall that was next to me because my brain just could not do that. It's each, true. Each eye was trying to focus at both distances, and I was standing there cross-eyed. It doesn't work for everybody. No. <laughs> but I had a set of these uh, multifocal lenses where it's, they're not bifocals, but the, the lens actually changes in focal length as you go down. Uh, they got a name for it. I oh, can't, okay. can't think of what it is. And the first time I put these things on, I thought I was going to fall over, you know. But it's amazing what your brain will adapt to. Yeah. So uh, this, this set actually allows me to see in the distance up the top and but shorter as it gets down here but uh, the problem is of course I don't want to shoot like this when I'm looking at iron sights for instance but but you could have them made in reverse right <laughs> yeah and people have done that actually had there, there is somebody that's making a lens that's got just a small area in here where you're looking through normally if you you know if you got the right right uh, cheek well and stance like on an iron sight rifle or shotgun then this is focused for that but it just so happened that these these lenses were made incorrectly and this this 
right eye isn't actually, it's less than my distance focus, but it, it, instead of having to read done, I realized it was perfect for shooting iron sight rifle or, for example, full radius iron sight shotgun. So now I've got a, I just happen to have a real nice focus on this front sight with these glasses. Okay. So I'm not, you know, I'm going to keep them because they happen to work out just, just for that in case I, I need to do that. But it's kind of a hassle because then when I come up to a stage, I got to start thinking to myself, well, if I got to shoot rifle, pistol, and shotgun, then I got to make a decision right. where, like you where go I'm going to com compromise my eyes to. Um, the best advice I could say on that would be, what has the hardest targets? Right, that's what I'm looking at. If the rifle shooting is especially demanding, well, I'm going to go for, for that. Right, or the, you, know? the, you might have, uh, you know, small plates for the pistol. Right. And that with the iron sights is going to be right where you want your focal length, and the rifle targets might be easier to hit. You might be able to see them through the scope Exactly, because even with my glasses that are focused for my pistol sights, I can still see the reticle in the scope. It's a little bit fuzzy, but, right. you know, I could make most what I would call uh, medium difficulty shots. Well, one of the things you can check out is uh, if you've got some different glasses made for different focal lengths, go out to the range and with a rifle, shoot some groups at 100 yards or 200 mm -hmm. yards. See what you're able to see with the different glasses so you're able to make better decisions when you get to the range. Right. And the bottom line is that uh, you can, if you get an optometrist who's uh, willing to work you with you a bit, you can really extend the lifespan of your vision in order to play this game. Right. And I, I think that's been one of the one of the driving forces behind that tactical scope class. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, which cracks yeah. me up because a lot of these same people are the ones that talk about not being able to shoot a handgun because it has iron sights on it. Mm -hmm. Well, a rifle with iron sights on it is X amount harder than oh, a yeah. handgun with right. iron sights. Right, much more um, difficult. You know, and so that's really driven that market, at least putting for getting a scope on the rifle. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the guys just don't want to shoot open guns, I guess. So. You know, they don't want to get all the other stuff built up, but it gives them a place to at least be able to hit something with a rifle. Right. Um, most people don't know this, but I actually used to wear glasses. Oh, really? And uh, it was, I believe, 1996 was when I had RK surgery. Yeah. Uh, by Leo, or Dr. Leo Boris, who's one of the founders of RK surgery, or of Line. And I went from, I don't know, I was like 2,200, you know, not too bad. You didn't bump into walls and stuff, mm -hmm. um, down to 2010. Mm -hmm. and he just nailed my eyes perfectly and so I haven't had to wear glasses since but it, it, it actually took me three or four years to have my brain settle into the way I saw now because I used to be uh, better than 2010 on my vision when I was corrected. Oh, I was okay. less than one in a hundred thousand as far as what I could correct to. I've read the, the patent and the copyright information at the bottom of the eye chart back mm -hmm. to the doctor and it kind of weirds them out when you read that part because that's not part of their chart thing there um, and so I've actually seen worse being at 2010 to 2015 than I was before when I had glasses hmm. and so you know anytime you change up your glasses or change up your your eyesight with doing RK surgery or you know which is now LRK they've gone to the laser model right. um, it's gonna take a while to settle in it's gonna take a, a time for your brain to adjust what it needs to do for you to shoot better so you know, be ready for that mm -hmm. and see if you can find an optometrist or ophthalmologist that'll actually work with you for what you're doing. If they, uh, like my guy, Kerry Pearson, incredible guy out of Mesa, Arizona, um, I can actually bring my guns in and aim them at the eye chart and, you know, see mm -hmm. the distances and, and play with the focal lengths until everything's just perfect. Right. And I think you've got somebody yep. pretty close that's, to that, that's too. That's a big help if you can find somebody who's willing to let you actually bring your gear in and see and, right. and understands you what you're going to do Ask them with. first. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. You know, yeah. I'm here for my eye test. It's not going to go over <laughs> that well. But if you can find somebody to work with like that, that's going to make it a lot easier. And it'll, ex it'll make your shooting more fun. And it'll help you last a lot longer in the sport. And it'll be a lot less frustrating. That's right. <laughs>you really do have to have some ability have to have some ability to maintain and clean your own guns. I mean, it's just too much to expect that you're going to take this into a gunsmith and have them cleaning all it for you. 
Yeah, right, it's, yeah. it's simple. Unless you, you have might, a gun you bearer. Might, right, you might. That'd be nice <laughs> okay. to work with. You know. So you might as well learn how to do it. Now, first off, I'm going to remove what they call the fire control group or the, or the trigger assembly. It's got a couple of pins that uh, travel through the receiver that retain that, and those pins are held in place by a couple of uh, D-ring springs. If I put the gun up, oh, very first thing, make sure that you check your gun. Chamber is clear. Nothing in the magazine. That's my uh, follower there. Now we've actually got a special modified end cap on this right now um, that has a hole in it. Then it's for a reloading drill. We're going to show you guys later. Right. That's why the end cap fell out right there. So check your guns, make sure they're clear, and then we start out by taking out the trigger group. I'm going to take a little drift, and I'm going to knock these uh, knock these pins through. Come out very easily. And these are what retain the whole fire control grip, which you can lift out just like that. When you take this out, you want to make sure that you don't lose these little D-ring clips. Let's see here. The little Those are what retain the trigger pins. If you lose this, this little spring clip here, well, then your trigger pins are going to fall right through the receiver, and uh, your whole fire control group could end up popping out of the gun you know, during the stage. That would be a bad thing. I'm sure that's happened. Here's the other thing that people commonly have a problem with. Uh, you see here, this is called the... Got to turn it like this. There you go. This is called uh, the disconnector uh, lever here. And uh, it, there's a, a set of linkage. You can see that the black lever is underneath this, the silver lever here, the, the stainless lever. And if, it's very easy to get those things interchanged so that this is on top. Once you get this on top, well then of course the gun, the trigger mechanism will not reset itself and you've got yourself a, a, a shotgun that will not fire. So you want to make sure that those stay black on bottom, silver on top, and if they happen to get switched around in the process of taking it in and out, uh, you'll know that because your trigger won't reset. You know, you're going to check that before you get it, get it back together. We got that out. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to pull the, the op lever out of the gun. I think I've dropped one also, of my Also called the bolt handle. Then I'm going to take off, I'd be taking off my magazine tube here. And when you do that, you want to make sure that you got safety glasses on because this is the spring that's in there. And it's a real snake and it can launch and hit you in the eye, obviously, if you don't have safety glasses on. Four inches slides right off. Barrel will pop out. Now, we've got uh, some rings here, and before you take these off, you want to take a good look to make sure that you see the order that they're on. First, there's a rubber O-ring, which is called the, the seal. That's Next. one of the cheapest parts in the gun that'll keep it from working. <laughs> <laughs> and I, in fact, later on, I'm going to go over a little bit of parts kit here that uh, if you take uh, these things along with you, you're going to find out you're going to solve about 98% of any problems might you, you might end up uh, having a, at a match and you'll be able to quickly repair those things. Nice. Now I've got another ring which is unique to the 1187. This is called the seal activator. What that does is it captures more gas in the operating system of the shotgun, there again allowing it to operate with, with lighter loads than it might normally operate with. Okay. Finally, this is the piston. And this is the part here that the, the gas from the barrel actuates on, and that piston creates an impulse against this weighted collar here, pushing the whole action bar assembly down and cycling the shotgun. Only has to move about this far, and it will actually... So it's really a gas-assisted shotgun. It blows it back, but then the spring tension and everything throws it back forward. Well, uh, just, like, uh, just like an AR-15 where you've got a bolt carrier, and that bolt carrier is the part that that captures enough kinetic energy to cycle the action, extracting, ejecting, and then stripping the next round. Well, this right, weight here, you might say, is the carrier because this is okay. what contains that kinetic energy. See, and you notice that it's got some free play here so that when that piston hits it, it gets it going fast enough so that now it has enough kinetic energy to cycle the action fully. See, there again, okay. extracting, ejecting, allowing the next round to be picked up from the magazine and fed up by the carrier. Now we're going to pull out the complete action bar assembly with the bolt on top of it. Right inside here, on the uh, right side of the, of the receiver, if you had it pointed down, is what we call the feed latch. 
in order to get the bolt assembly and the carrier or the, the, the uh, action bar assembly and the bolt out, I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to press that action bar assembly into the receiver which releases all of this and now I can completely remove the whole action bar assembly and the bolt assembly. While we're looking at this, let's take a look in here. Can, you, can we see this? Uh, let's see. There we got an image of that. Right on the other side of the receiver, you see that there's a lever that moves up and down on a rivet. This is called the interceptor latch. And this is one of the things that gives people a lot of, a lot of trouble on these guns. The purpose of the interceptor latch is to stop the next round. In other words, the feed latch releases one round, and then the interceptor latch comes up to block the rim of the next it's also cartridge. Like so an it, interrupter. An interrupter, right? Yeah. So that it, it uh, will singly feed, and uh, you won't have that double feed, which is kind of the jam from hell. <laughs> yeah, when you get one of those on an 1100, it's get a screwdriver out and start taking your gun apart. Right. Well, I, I had that problem a while back, and I got so good at clearing with my spider code that I thought there should be a separate, uh, uh, you know, bonus points for that. But <laughs> 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 that was a that was an ammunition-related issue. We'll, we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Now, now let's get into the actual cleaning of the whole thing. I would say that oh, one more part we got to take out here. Oh yeah. This is called the link. Now, this was earlier one of the safety things we were talking about. These edges, um, right inside here, these little rails where all the stuff rides, the bolt and the little yep, That's actually pieces, the internal track where the action bar assembly rides. Are, are so incredibly sharp. They're razor sharp. Yeah, you can easily and cut yourself. I don't know an 1100 owner that's taken apart his gun that hasn't sliced their fingers open on them, trying to put it back together. Right. So if you're wiping out that area, make sure you use a rag or something wrapped over your fingers and stuff. Don't use just the single piece of the rag or a little piece of cloth. Run it in there. You'll just zip right through your finger. Well, after you do it once, then you'll... Yeah, it's a, it's a way to learn anything. <laughs> Drop a TV on your foot once. You won't do it again. Now, I'd say that if I had to uh, make a guess that uh, uh, assuming you've chosen the right ammunition, uh, the next most common problem with, with the 1187 or 1100 series as far as it not working is fouling on the outside of the magazine tube. This is what we call an external piston gun. In other words, the piston rides on the outside of the magazine tube. So it's really important to keep this thing clean and uh, I would clean it after... Here's after an advertisement for Scotch-Brite, the <laughs> 3M right. pads. So it's actually worse out in, uh, in, in dry climates like desert climates because this fouling, which consists of, oh, carbon uh, blow-by and plastic from the wad and, and whatnot, uh, in a really dry weather, it'll actually solidify and just be like as hard as concrete on there. And once that stuff is solidified on there, you notice that the piston doesn't want to operate on the outside of the magazine tube. So there's a tremendous amount of friction there. You notice this, it should be, operate freely like this. And once that fouling is built up on there, well, then the piston does not want to, want to cycle. What does that boil down to? Well, then that means you, may, you need that much more energy to over, for that piston to overcome that fouling on, on the outside of the tube. So uh, if you start out uh, a stage with a low recoil slug that has, say, lower port pressure, well, the gun may not even cycle. After it cycles a few times and it sloughs that off, may, it, it might start working for you, but you're still going to be right on the edge of, of the reliability of the envelope. Well, what I always did, the one thing I always did when I was shooting an 1100 was before every single stage was pull the barrel and polish that with some Scotch-Brite. You know, it, it generally... I mean, it takes, it takes a minute, but that was the one thing that tried to help keep those guns working. Right. I would, I would say that typically you wouldn't have to do it between every stage, but I would probably do it every night. You know, I, think, between, I think it was more of a... It made, made, it made, you made me feel <laughs> better. Yeah, I, I felt a little <laughs> more comfortable. I've gotten so that I... <laughs> I don't bother to, I can actually run the gun for a whole match now, especially with these new stainless magazine tubes. Okay. They, they, they were a little bit better in that respect. The old 1100s with the carbon steel magazine tube, uh, they were much more prone to that That's following. all I shot was right. the 1100, yeah. so. And, and also, uh, with a little bit of humidity, well then of course they would start to rust up. And right. uh, that's another thing, you, you fellows out there that have, say, older 1100s, uh, they will form rust pits on here and that rust pit will cause the uh, gas to leak. So we're going to run this thing in here and clean that fouling off and then take an oily rag and put a residue of oil on that. So you like running this part wet because there's two trains of thought there or schools of thought. Right. Um, the wet gun versus the dry gun. 
I know in the Midwest, a wet gun isn't on an 1100 isn't nearly as big a deal as a, a wet under area here right. can be a real pain in the dusty environment. Yeah, it depends on your environment, exactly. See, like if I was going to shoot out in Reno, for instance, right. I would probably run my gun completely dry and lube it with graphite. Right, yeah. Yeah, but in a grassy environment where I don't have to worry about that, I'm going to run a wet gun. Okay, so. so it's just one of those things to come up with and, and figure out what you need to do. Okay, so we've got this cleaned up. Now, what do you do on the bolt and the uh, trigger area and that kind of parts? The bolt, uh, it's not necessary to take the bolt down further than this unless you've got... And that's a, just the way it came right off a, of the... A parts breakage problem. This is the extractor. This is your firing pin. And this black thing in here is called a, a bolt buffer, and that's where the firing or that's where the hammer strikes as it hits the firing pin. It takes up the excess energy from the from the hammer. Eventually, that breaks, and that that's something that should be replaced every few years, depending on how many rounds that you put through the gun. While you got this off, you also want to check your firing pin re or retractor spring, and see if it happens to be broken. Eventually, these things break, and once the firing pin retractor spring breaks, it starts curling in on each other, and then you lose the tension on it, and of course, then the firing pin doesn't reset, and the gun won't right. fire. <laughs> so that's another like there's another like maintenance thing that I would say every few years I would just replace that before it has a chance to break at a match. How many thousand rounds? Because some people might shoot a thousand rounds a year, some people might shoot ten thousand. Uh, you know, one nice thing about about the Remington series of shotguns is that all these parts are just nickel dime, and so. For a few cents, uh, I don't know what that spring's probably a buck and a half or something. Maybe I'd replace it every year. The parts are ubiquitous. Uh, you know, almost every gunsmith carries almost all the nickel dime uh, mis you know, miscellaneous parts that may cause you problems. So even if you don't take your own, you can probably find them at, if there's a local gun shop. Now, let's look a look at a barrel once. Obviously, most of you know how to clean a barrel, and you'd use your, your typical brushes and mops to clean the, the bore of the, of, of the shotgun, and, and if the, in particular the chamber. You want to make sure that you can get that fouling out of the chamber. And that plastic residue that accumulates up the barrel, you want to get that out of there. And uh, Generally, I'll use a good stiff stainless brush with uh, some solvent to, to take that out. You have nothing like an electric drill to get that stuff out of there. But here's another area that will get people in trouble. This is the, the gas collar here on the barrel and uh, the piston has to be able to move smoothly in that collar. And after a while, of course, uh, lead and plastic blow-by starts filling that up. And uh, I had my, my shotgun go down many years ago at an SOS stage because I cleaned everything, but I forgot this. Oh, so you can actually <laughs> so, take and roll up right, the scotch You can roll pipe. this up, clean this all out in there, and then take a dental pick, and there's the little forward ridge. I don't know if you can see it. Yep, right in here. That you can see that it's lit up right there. That ridge, you need to scrape that out with a dental pick, and that allows the, the O-ring gas seal to butt right up where it needs to be. Okay. Now you see your gas ports. Can you see the gas ports in there? Uh, right there, very obvious, yep. Uh, you want to find out what drill size fits in those ports and take that drill and run it in and out of there even just by hand, typically, because as you shoot the gun, there's some carbon fouling that starts building up in those parts, and obviously that restricts the ports. The more the ports are restricted, the less gas is available to operate the and shotgun. And the heavier the ammo you need right. to run the gun until it just doesn't function anymore. Now, this cleaning of the outside of the magazine tube, that's something, like I said, uh, Matt does it. You were saying you do it after every stage. I would well, probably do it. Well, I was shooting it. these, I was shooting the 1100s, yep. not the 1187s. That, that's the most, the most frequent maintenance thing you've got to do. The rest of this stuff is less frequent, uh, but I would probably do this, the, this maintenance uh, protocol we're talking about here, say, after every event. Uh, but in particular, cleaning the outside of the magazine tube, uh, you may want to do that like every evening. Okay. Now, do you do anything with the trigger system at all? You would want to uh, uh, eventually, after every, say, 500 to 1,000 rounds, I would wash this out with, uh, it's like if you've got a solvent tank or a gun scrubber or one of those things, actually wash, because it, this will start to load up with unburned powder. Uh, shotguns okay. are relatively low pressure uh, rounds, and so you end up with a lot of uh, unburned powder starting to blow back into the action and accumulate. So eventually, you want to blow this out if you got a compressed air with a solvent and then re uh, if you press the safety off and release the trigger and let, let the hammer down right here is your hammer notch and that's an area that you want to apply like uh, some kind of a trigger lube you know like uh, we sell a ride all grease there's a McCormick has a trigger slick I think and mm -hmm. there's several of them out there high solids grease in this area 
and that will give you a nice smooth release on the trigger. If your trigger starts feeling rough, it's probably because this, this between the hook and the sear, that's that's dried out, and you've got, you know, you've got a that'll make the gun the trigger release feel feel rough instead of smooth. Now, the uh, action bar assembly, uh, you know, very simple to wash this off and clean it up. But uh, some things you should really look at. If your, gun, if your gun has thousands and thousands of rounds through it, eventually you might notice that, the, that these tips of these areas here where the, where the uh, bolt lever fits into, those are starting to break off. And that would indicate that you need a new action bar assembly. You notice that it's got a, a little ball detent in the back. Yeah, you can see it there, yes. And that is what retains the bolt operating lever. If your bolt operating lever starts falling out while you're shooting the gun, it's a pretty darn good indication that you need a whole new action bar assembly. There again, it's probably oh, wow. about a $45, $50 part. But uh, if, if, that's, if it's not retaining this, then you know that the rest of the part is, is pretty well worn and the timing notches may start to wear a little bit off here. The, these notches in the action bar assembly are what actually determine the timing of the events in the gun. In other words, the, the, the release of the shell that coming out of the magazine tube and, uh, and the feed, the whole feed function of the gun. Okay. Now, that pretty much takes care of the gun cleaning wise. You don't need to do anything in the stock. Um, inside well, of here, me, I would wipe this part out. I would, uh, you do. I would say that really? if, you're, if you're shooting the gun, say, uh, I don't think I'd worry about it every thousand rounds, but say every several thousand rounds, which however that stacks up for you, you want to take off the buttstock, and in that buttstock is the action spring assembly. Okay. And you want to take that action spring out of there, and there's an action spring follower right here. It looks kind of like a little uh, wine goblet. And uh, uh, after you get enough old lubricant and uh, bun burn powder fouling in this, well there again it starts to restrict the movement of that and that will cause the gun to cycle sluggishly. Also if this thing ever bends on you, there again, it binds up, that, that's a problem. As soon as that, uh, this, this action spring follower, if that bends, well then of course that'll bind inside of this tube and could cause the gun to malfunction. In fact, I would say after about uh, oh, six, seven, eight thousand rounds, I'd probably replace this spring in here because that spring will eventually take a, take a set there again. It's a relatively inexpensive part. Yeah, you've got to do maintenance on these guns. Uh, you got to have the small replacement parts that are necessary. This is I, this is called the link, and it does just what it says. It links up the action bar assembly to the action spring follower, and it, you notice it looks like a wishbone here, and it pushes that back into that cab that tube in the stock. And uh, this is another part that, after so many thousands of rounds, one of these little ends of this thing may break off. And if it breaks off, of course, that'll pop out of the pocket in the action spring follower, and that'll stick out in the receiver, and then, of course, it'll make it possible for the gun to cycle. The gun will essentially be locked closed. So another part that, why wait till it breaks? Right. You know, it's probably, uh, I don't know what these are, five, six, seven bucks. You might as well buy a new one and, and stick it in there every few years. And that brings us to this. If you're, if you're going to an event, why not take a little parts kit along? And what I like to see is an extra firing pin. Okay. The firing pin retra retractor spring that just about hit the floor. A link, an extra extractor. Okay. And of course, if the extractor breaks, the extractor spring and the extractor plunger are still going to be in the bolt. But in the process of you're changing this out, you've got a really high probability of losing those parts. So you might as well have all three, the extractor, the extractor spring and its its plunger. Okay. Here's that bolt buffer I was talking about, which having a spare one fits of those right back here. Idea. You know, all of about fifty cents there. So between these parts and an O-ring seal, there's the, here's a little O-ring that traps the gas that makes the gun work. This, by the way, this thing here, you definitely want to replace this thing. I'd say about every thousand rounds. You know, it's yeah. It, well, it's, I mean, buy packs of ten of the things. And right, they're cheap. Just, just them have around. them. In fact, I usually have them inside the butt of my my shotgun, so they're just with it all the time. Oh, okay. And here's another seal activator in case you lose that. So if you uh, carry a little bag with these parts, you're probably going to be able to solve any non-ammunition related problem that the gun has probably 98% of the time. Okay. Uh, let's get on to modifications that are suggestions for keeping the gun running. What, yeah. what do you guys do at the factory to 
or not well, JP. As, sure. You know, we've, uh, the way we set these guns up actually, uh, we defeat this gas bleed off system. Because what oh, we're trying okay. to do is we're trying to retain as much gas in the operating system as possible to, because uh, we, we're, we're making the assumption that uh, this is a game gun. We're not going to be uh, shooting, say, two and three quarter magnums or uh, th those type right. of loads which have a different application. So we're, we're kind of biasing the gun towards some of the lower recoil loads that people want to use. So we're, we're defeating this, this here at the, where the, normally the gas bleed off collar would go. Okay. And we're also using the seal activator. Uh, if, if a fellow wanted to shoot nothing but say ounce and a quarter high power field loads, like three and three quarter gram equivalent ounce and a quarter, then I probably wouldn't use this. Okay. You wouldn't have to because what the, they're the same thing. The idea with this is that it uh, traps more gas. Traps more gas, and you not that uh, not that you're going to ruin the gun by using it in combination with those loads. I, I use it when I shoot those loads occasionally. I'm not worried about taking it out there. But if you shot nothing but a steady diet of say high velocity loads and the gun set up this way, well, you're going to end up breaking, say, links and extractors maybe sooner than you would because your bolt velocity ends up being faster than it okay. needs to be. Now, there again, I, I kind of like to run this a little bit on the wet side in non-dusty environments. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm running the gun in a really badly dusty environment, well, then I'm going to run it pretty much dry and I'm going to use graphite. And I'm a really big fan of Graphite. I like to use graphite for all sorts of things, but in the shotgun it has some very special applications. You should never have any wet lube inside the magazine tube or inside the magazine extension tube. If you've got, okay. if you've got a wet lube in there, you're just asking for trouble because if sooner or later you're going to get sand and dust and grit in there and of course that stuff just retains it against the walls and a little piece of sand in there uh, is going to prevent, uh, is going to bind your shells up as they come, come through here. So the, when I you want to use a, uh, there again, the same, the same uh, uh, tools that you're using to clean your bore out, you want to run down here and clean the, and the uh, magazine tube and, sure it's and dry extension then. and dry it. Make sure you run a, like a, right. uh, a patch with, say, a degreaser in there to dry it out completely. Okay. Then I put my follower back in there. Oh, let's just take a look at that. Here, this is the follower, all right? Uh, word about followers. There's some, uh, some followers out there that are extended like this. What we found is that the, some of the plastic on those is a bit on the soft side and it tends to gall up and bind inside here. We actually like the original factory followers uh, for reliability purposes. I a actually better. like the old metal ones that you can Metal find ones them. are great, yep. But, yeah. but this actually, this new hard plastic one, we found works pretty good. And I'll actually rub this in some graphite. Spray this, uh, if you go to the hardware store, they got those tubes of graphite that locksmiths use, yeah, and that's, that's what we're talking about. Right, they're cheap, and a tube of that stuff has all sorts of application, not only in a shotgun, but like in your magazines for your rifle magazine. pistols. Yep. In fact, those Beta C mags, they mm -hmm. come with a tube of that for that very reason. So we'll try to get some graphite on there, put that in the tube, and then I would spray some of that graphite right down inside the tube before we reassemble the gun. Now, we'll uh, go ahead and, and uh, kind of reverse the whole process of, uh, of, of dis disassembly. And we're going to put the link in here first. And so the link that go, pretty goes... pretty much drops into its it, own little it track. It drops into the track, pretty much where okay. it goes. But of course, the two legs of it are going to be laying down in the top of the receiver right now. So you've got to get those back into the little cup of that, of that action spring followers. So you take a needle nose plier. we can actually do it this way. There we go. So uh, I'm going to compress those and place those right in that cup. Okay, perfect. Now we know that's in place. Remember, if you put your fingers in there, be careful. <laughs> I'm going to place my bolt right on top of the action or the uh, the uh, action bar assembly. I'm going to start it, and then I'm going to press just the reverse. I'm going to press that latch in, right. which allows that to enter the, the receiver. Okay, one of the reasons my guns weren't working is I just kind of put that back in there. Hmm. I just kind of forced the bolt oh, back for the <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, right. I'm using a Benelli now. Because <laughs> that would do uh, bad things to your, your shell latch. kind of noticed that. Now I'm going to take my, my bolt handle and shove it right back into there and it locks into place. So that's working fine. Next thing, I'm going to take my piston. That was the last thing I took off. First thing to go back on this little uh, thing called the seal activator, another metal ring, finally the rubber gas seal. Now, 
At this point, we can put the uh, the trigger plate or the fire control group back in there. Is there any trick for getting that back? Yeah, in? there is a little bit. You got to kind of putz with it a bit, and uh, I find that you might want to open the action just ever so slightly. And uh, does the safety position make a difference? Or no, there we go. It just clicks in all. It of just a clicks in all of a sudden, okay. and then I'm going to look. I'm going to visually look through here to see that my holes are lined up, and. Uh, and reinstall my pins. Okay. Now at this point, you can actually lock the action back, which is kind of handy for when you're going to slip the barrel back on over the uh, magazine tube. Okay. Next, the forend. All right. Now. We're going to show your you. There's trap again. Yeah, right. See, it, that's why you want to keep your thumb out of there. Now, here's a little trick. Uh, getting this uh, spring back in there with less than four hands can be a real problem, especially if you have to do it out at the range at a match. So it's handy to drill a hole in the end of this uh, magazine tube, allowing you to put a uh, cleaning rod guide in there. So now I'm going to capture the spring, just like the spring guide on a 1911. And uh, this is going to go a long way in allowing you to control this whole thing and get it back on the gun. That's the chunk there. So let's get get this back in here. At least get as much back in the tube as we can, and then use the rod to capture the rest. Okay. There we go. Piece of cake. See, it only took us four hands. Hey, uh, and the thing is, if the uh, if the spring isn't captured by this, it can actually punch out the side and. <laughs> it, it can give you, yeah, that's a lot of spring. And while we're talking about that spring, let's just mention, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to place the buttstock between my, my toes here. Thank you. I don't know if you can get that. And that's how I'm going to brace the gun up as I take my hand and torque this back down. That's about as much torque as you want to put on it. You shouldn't be using any tools to torque this past, past this point. Okay. Now, on a, on a little safety note there, John, that better have been a clear John, gun after That's right. And after, you got your, after you got the muzzle pointed at your chin there when you're... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, be careful with what you're doing. Make sure you got no live ammo in the area or anything you're working with right. whenever you do a gun. Uh, one of the little other safety notes is sometimes you might be empty on your chamber and a round might have just snuck up underneath and might have stuck in the tube just a little bit up there or something else. You rack right. it, it looks clear, it slips in. That's why it's so important to check both chamber and magazine you tube. You've got to check you know. the chamber and here and make sure you can actually see the orange follower or, or the mm -hmm. follower itself and make sure that there's no ammo in the gun. Right. And doing anything with it. Um, that pretty much takes care of the 1100, 1187s and uh, shows you some of the spare parts you need. If you get out to the range and you're having problems, take a look for those little issues. Right. And the, the cleaner you keep these guns, generally the happier they are. They're not like the handguns and the rifles that you can generally just shoot until they stop working. Mm -hmm. These will stop working a lot quicker. Right, they've got a, what I would call a, a, a narrower window of, of operation. And in, all things have to be inside that window to make the thing you know, have it continue to operate. <laughs>so when people look at, they'll be going, I've never seen one like that. So that's so my- So have them call you to order That's one. my, no, 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't make these. Anyways, 22 uh, inch Benelli, um, extended magazine tube. Uh, one of the things I like best about the Benellis is, I, I describe it as the 1911 of shotguns. Again, no disrespect to anybody else's guns, just from a personal perspective. Um, this gun is uh, extremely easy to maintain, not a lot of moving parts. As you saw, I removed the uh, barrel nut, or excuse me, the Be careful when you're the taking magazine, the spring out so you capture it. The magazine clamp off just using the, uh, the provided uh, 
doohickey. That's yeah. a technical term. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. It, it, there is really, <coughs> there's probably an actual part number, but I doubt there's a name for Correct. it. Correct. And of course, take off my side saddle here. Just nice thing about that is it's just, Drop it's Velcro. Move the barrel. Next Order is comes uh, off at the same time. Yep. A couple of different uh, charging handle styles. This is the one I prefer. Move the bolt. This is where we kind of do a two-sided part here is to uh, disassemble the bolt, okay. main capture the firing pin, and pull. Remove the, the cross pin. Okay. Take out the firing pin. Then just like the the uh, AR-15, it's got a, a cam pin and the bolt, and then the inertia, uh, inertia spring. Cool thing is now you take your, your firing pin and you push out your trigger group retaining pin, and you now have a disassembled gun. Wow. So that's one of the things I personally like about it. Well, I remember when I got the Benelli from Bevan Grams, and um, I shot it for about six months, and then it didn't didn't work. Didn't work anymore, and that's when I called you up, and you're the one that actually taught me how to clean the darn thing. Yes. After you yelled at me for not cleaning. For not cleaning it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we, as we talked earlier, um, it's a shotgun. It always works. These things work great, but you have to clean them. You got to maintain them. Got to maintain them. Um, on the Benelli, uh, the biggest thing I've noticed is keeping the receiver clean. Um, specifically, and this is a tough one to show, but um, Let's see if we get a close up in there. Are we in there? Inside here are the guide rails that the bolt goes along. Okay. So on both the left side and the right side, make sure those are really clean. And I'll even take a uh, one of the cleaning tips uh, toothpicks and just actually get into the corners and remove all the junk that gets built up in there. Even that's got a little bit in there, even though the gun it's was clean. Well, spotless. Well, yeah, the, the, the nice thing about the Benelli, um, with it being a delayed blowback action, is the combustible material all goes down the barrel. There's no, it's not able to feed back into the gun. Like the gas, the gas guns, you get you know, right. debris back in there, where the, this pretty much, I think they stay cleaner longer. Uh, in okay. fact, there's one of the guys down at our club, he's got 5,000 rounds for his Benelli. And he hasn't, he probably doesn't know how to take it apart. No, he told me he'd call me when it was ready to go, but he hasn't, <laughs> he's not ready to clean it yet. So that's kind of amazing unto itself. Not normal at all. Um, let's see, what do we want to go through first? Uh, I think the bolt um, is, you know, one of the, you know, again, it looks kind of like a, the carrier, we'll call mm -hmm. it, like kind of like the AR. Um, you see on this one, it's been polished on just a couple of surfaces. Uh, Basically, the parts that were almost shiny in the first place. Shiny in the first place. Uh, again, with the Benelli, uh, any additional friction in the gun right. increases the amount of force necessary to cycle it. You remove the friction, it cycles more easily. Okay. And what do you use to polish that <coughs> up? Um, I just used a gunsmith's friend, a Dremel. A Dremel tool. <laughs> and a, a Kratex wheel, the little rubber wheels. Okay. And uh, just remove the... Uh, the surface paint off there. I didn't remove any material, just, just clean it up. So uh, again, your inertia spring. Again, clean everything out. Just gun scrubber, hose it okay. down, wipe it off. Uh, so you have for reassembly here, you've got the inertia spring that'll go in first. On the uh, rotating bolt, which is just a, a large version of an AR bolt. Yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of just a large piston right. that floats back and right. forth. So this goes in, you know, next course, just Again, not a lot of moving parts. Make sure that you clean out underneath the uh, extractor. Okay. If you get debris built up underneath there, you'll lose your extractor tension. Yeah, because it's holding it further and further away from the case. Correct. Again, just you know, hose it out with gun scrubber. Next is the uh, cam pin. Okay. Pointy end down. Pointy end down. There's actually a, uh, I don't know if you can see this or not. Indicator mark. There's on a it. small indicator mark on it. And that goes in the same plane as the. Uh, the firing pin that'll go in next. That helps you figure out where the little hole is for shoving the firing pin through it. Correct, correct. Um, and then following that will be the firing pin. One thing to watch for as you're shooting the gun uh, is there's a, uh, an area here on the head of the firing pin that will mushroom out okay. if you're doing dry fire practice. Mm -hmm. 
it's, you know, we'll call it a weak link in the system. Um, and that's something to be aware of. That you'll have to break that edge every now and then. I know, I've had to grind mine off. And I just take a small file and just scrape the edges until my, actually I do it until my fingernail doesn't catch on anything. Correct. And you, I've heard of people shooting and they say, well, you pull the trigger, nothing's happening. That's because the firing pin actually got bound up inside here. Yeah, it seizes inside the metal. Correct. So that's uh, something to be aware of. And then uh, the next potential wear item is on the firing pin cross pin. Hmm. There's a small O-ring on here that it wears and, and breaks. And what does the O-ring do? The O-ring actually just uh, creates friction to keep the cross pin in place. Ah, uh -huh, okay. That's all it does. And then... Uh, You'd never actually told me that. Well, you haven't broken one yet. Okay. <laughs> I check for it every time I... <laughs> every time I bring my gun over. There you go. go. Hey, um, help me out. And then, of course, uh, one thing to check on this is make sure that the... Uh, the amount of tension on the firing pin spring is adequate. So it's pushing the bolt forward? So the bolt's being pushed forward. Okay. Any spring that's maintained uh, you know, under compression over a period of time loses its force. Well, a key to the operation of the Benelli is that, fire, that uh, spring has to be full tension in order to keep the bolt forward. So as it's pushing the round into the gun, the locking lugs line up in the barrel. Okay. So just a key item, you know, you replace magazine springs in your pistol, you replace all these other items in your pistol on a regular basis, got to do the same thing on your shotguns, whether it's uh, 1100, 1187, you maintain the correct spring tension, you maintain reliability in the gun. Okay. Um, on the trigger, trigger assembly, um, keep it dry. Um, so you don't lubricate the trigger? We assembly. don't. The only thing we've lubricated them with lately, of course, down here in the desert, Lubitrax you know, dust. Lubitrax dust. We've actually been using powdered graphite on these. Okay. That's and the same thing John said about a lot of the parts on the 1100. Okay. Uh, works the same thing. Again, uh, a potential wear item on here is the elevator, um, this spring I've completely forgotten. The elevator spring. The elevator spring. Well, that's not actually what it's called. Okay. But that's it's the one on the left side of the trigger group? Yeah. It's the one, it's the only coil spring on there other than your safety and your hammer spring. Okay. Uh, but that's an important spring to maintain full tension on because that's what lifts the shell into the, uh, the receiver area to load. Okay. Um, other than that, that's, you know, the basics. Uh, an, another important area to clean on these guns is the locking lug area. Again, if you get buildup of debris. The some, lugs are just, let's see if we can see those. Can you see those They're in there? Just inside, right in there, just before the edge of the chamber. Yeah. And that's actually where the bolt cams into place. Correct. And the, one of the things you can check is you can rotate or put the bolt in place and actually watch them lock in. Okay. So you can sit there and check the operation of it. Well, that, you could also see then if there's any worn edges or any edges that are burred over. Correct. And the bolt's not locking up properly. Correct. Uh, and again, you know, getting back to the wear edges, uh, the front of the extractor, this needs to be smooth and clean. Okay. Because that rides over the barrel hood in this section here. Got that? Okay. So, again, friction. You remove your friction, you increase your reliability. Right. And uh, you can see on the back sides here, just so that they're uh, debris free, so that they ride smoothly over this side of the bolt. Okay, so for uh, one last thing to clean, which I'm sure a lot of people don't do, is actually the magazine tube. Right. Um, I clean the magazine tube the same way I clean the barrel. And they actually make a magazine tube brush. It's a larger diameter than a standard bore brush. Okay. And again, just a tighter fit. You're able to get the debris that builds up in this area because, you, you know, people drop shells on the ground. You feed them in the mag into the magazine. Well, you're going to get a collection of debris in here plus any residual gases and, and crud that kind of go through the gun. Okay. So clean the magazine tube as well as the barrel. Okay. Specifically on the barrel, um, you see this is already loose, but you can Now, do you lube the outside of the threads on Yes, there? yes. Put just a, a, a small coating of oil on there. Just a drop. There we go. God, it's thick. That's the high-density oil. 
Actually, that's the light stuff. Really? I tell you, see the thick stuff. Okay, well, that's a little thick in my opinion. Um, but again, it works. Just a, a little bit of oil in there. Make sure that it's uh, rust free. So now for the reassembly. I'll try not to go too fast here, because. No, oh, wait a second here. How do you go about cleaning your barrel? Because I know what I do. I use an electric drill. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the best thing we found. They <laughs> they do make. That's a chrome lined barrel, so. Correct. They you are. almost can't hurt it. Correct. Yeah, you're not going to hurt anything with a bronze brush. Um, in fact, using a, a cordless drill, mm -hmm. a brush, it just makes short work of it. And do it on a regular basis. Don't do it every year. Yeah, I noticed. Um, um, it took me a lot longer to get the plastic out of there. And I yeah. think I was shooting a full choke by the time I was done. Probably. <laughs> you know, again, maintaining your gun. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about slug, slug, slug impacts. Mm -hmm. Um, you get debris built in there, uh, your choke doesn't fit correctly, things start to change, your point of aim changes. Um, if it's clean, it's going to be consistent. Okay. So now back to the reassembly. Yeah. All right. On the Benelli specifically, um, you have your bolt release. Okay. The way I remember it is button, bolt release. Two Bs. So depress the bolt release, take your trigger assembly. Yeah, that was really hard to get in there without pushing that button. Uh, yeah, it just it won't go in. And it's notched, so it'll just slide into place. Cross pin goes from right to left. Okay. All right. Next is going to be our bolt, which people tend have a tendency to put way too much oil on these things. Okay. Only lubricate the bearing surfaces. And if I could have the briquette lube. That's action lube, by the way. Action lube. Okay. <laughs> just um, just a just a just a dab will do it because this stuff is really that thicker. stuff lasts forever. Yeah. And um, just the bearing surfaces. Now, you, okay, you do actually coat the lugs. A I little put bit. a little just a little on the lugs. That's typically more than I use. Okay. And of course, um, the cam pin. Okay. So I'm actually going to cheat here a little bit and just put some on the. Uh... Yeah. Because uh, you know, down here in the desert, we're going to get a lot of dust, and the more oil you have, the more dust you're going to get. So you just don't need it. I remember going up to SOS one of my first times, and somebody took a can of WD-40 and just hosed down the receiver. It was like, what are you doing? No, it's a good way of making a gun not work. Yep. And then. Uh, Reassembling it, um, you have to drop the pigtail yeah, the of the carrier into it, the recoil plunger. It's got to catch that plunger. Well, it just has to find the hole. All right. Reinsert the charging handle. Okay. So far, so good. On the uh, on the recoil plunger in the mm -hmm. back of these guns. Mm -hmm. um, on the older guns, uh, there was a lot of uh, rust that would build up because they have a carbon steel plunger and then the carbon steel spring. Okay. So again, getting back to the friction issue, by cleaning all that out, putting in a clean spring, putting a little bit of grease in there, removes the, re removes the friction, increases the reliability. Uh, on the barrel, there's a, on the barrel hood, there's a, uh, a notch that lines up with the receiver. Okay. Now it's an aluminum receiver. So don't force it. Don't force it. It'll, it'll click into place. Don't. Yeah, it'll literally slide into place. It's like anything, if you have to force it, you're doing it wrong. And uh, one of the very important things on putting the barrel in to the receiver is ensuring that the barrel is fully seated. Okay. If that wobbles around, you're going to eat away at that notch and eventually have a gun you can't shoot. Install the barrel nut. One of the things I found is um, by rotating the barrel, let's see, that's going to be counterclockwise. Okay. Just a, just a tear takes, while you're tightening down the barrel nut, ensures that the barrel is not going to be riding up against the bolt. Oh, okay, so it won't smack yeah, in. If, there, if there's a tolerancing issue in here at all, tighten that down and you can. You can see the difference going counterclockwise, and if you, you can actually, on some guns, you can rotate it into the bolt and actually 
this one's not going to work. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can actually stop the bolt from cycling. Okay. So there, sometimes there's just enough of a wobble in there that it can affect the operation of the gun. So just go counterclockwise with the barrel, clockwise yeah. with the nut. Well, and, it, and if you get confused as far as left and right, do it one way. If it tightens up the bolt, do it the opposite way. Okay. <laughs> kind of simple, but... And then on the, uh, on the magazine tube, I, I've got into the habit of using a little bit of powdered graphite. Okay. The dry graphite stuff. And uh, again, that ends up on the follower. And the great trick. Yeah, I really like the uh, trick from uh, that was, uh, JP on using the rod to the end. Extremely good. Well, it looks like you could do it on this one too because yeah, there's a nice big hole on it. Yes, it is. So that one went on nice and easily for a change. Now, we talked earlier about slug. Yeah. Slug impact. I loosen mine maybe just a, a sixteenth of a turn. You've got the, the nuts tight. The nut is tight. And this part is actually loose, so there's almost, there's just a little bit of flomp in it. Just a little bit of play in there. And, and that's I, actually kind of critical for the slug stuff. Correct. Because that way I know that the next time I shoot slugs, it's going to be the exact same place it was before. And I've seen many people with the two-piece magazine tubes tighten up the magazine tube and then put on their barrel clamp because that's mm -hmm. what the Benelli's come with. And they don't know why they're slugs aren't hitting where they were. All right, because that'll actually take the barrel and flex it and change the impact point significantly. Oh, yeah. yeah you can, right. Especially on the longer barrels. If you tighten them down, you can see the thing just go wonk. Oh, gosh, yes. And then just tighten down the... Uh, How tight do you take that? Just, just finger tight, just but snug. not... Uh. See, the, 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 the nice thing about this little tool that they provide, it's actually used for re um, retaining the uh, magazine uh, restriction. Oh, okay. A little aluminum thing for the bird hunting applications, but you can't over torque the screw. Okay. So, so you use a screwdriver, you can really you can over, on it. Yeah, and it's you know it doesn't require a lot. Okay. Is there any other uh, modifications that you would suggest to the gun itself? I mean, <laughs> I've always I've always liked a softer recoil pad. Oh, I I, I tell you what, the uh, the field stock with mm -hmm. the adjustable comb is to me a gotta have item. Uh, the oversized. Uh, mag, uh, safety, which is nice because when you're shooting and you come into the ready position, your finger can be outside the trigger guard, you bump the safety on with the inside of your knuckle, and so you're going from the trigger to here, right. as opposed to making a two position move going from here and then forward. Um, I've been using the, uh, uh, the limb saver, it's kind of a gel recoil pad. Okay really takes the bite out of the slugs. Now one of the modifications Benelli sells is that mercury reducer for the stock. Yeah. Um, and adding weight to a Benelli is not necessarily a good thing. No, and, and I've, I have experience on both sides of that. One, this is significant, this is probably about a pound heavier than a standard Benelli. Okay. Uh, standard off the shelf M1 Benelli weighs about six and a half pounds. Okay. This is closer to seven and a half. Um, this was built for the old Soldier Fortune parameters mm -hmm. and the old IMA three gun requirements where it's a 22 inch barrel with a magazine tube that extends one inch past the barrel. Okay. This gun will hold 11 rounds. Mm -hmm. One of the few shotguns that will. Uh, 1100, you can't do that in this mechanical configuration. In this length? With a 22 okay. inch barrel. Right. Um, so I can run with a full, uh, full side saddle of eight rounds, two or three rounds on the fore end and 11 rounds in the gun and shooting a standard ounce and an eighth, three and a quarter dram load, okay. it'll cycle without any problem. So by adding the extra weight in the back of the stock, to me it off balances the gun and just adds weight that you don't need. I think by adding the recoil reducing uh, butt pad is a better option than the recoil reducer itself. Okay. Any other modifications? Uh, the charging handle, again, that's a preference issue. Um, I like the factory, this is what they call the Remington style uh, charging handle. Low profile, but it's a little bit larger than if you grab actually your shotgun. Yeah, I've got the extremely low profile. That's the original uh, charging handle, which is teeny tiny. Uh, there's a couple aftermarket ones. Um, some people put on the, uh, the flapper right. bolt release. I've actually put on a, a larger button. I I've gone the route where 
I need to keep the gun charged. If I have to go to here, I did something wrong. So I'm kind of going a, a different direction as far as why I want to use the bolt release. I don't use it for select slugs. I just use it in case I actually go to slide lock, which is preferably never. <laughs> well, if you go to slide lock on these guns, you actually have a different problem than when you're on a, on a uh, 1100. Correct. Because you have to throw a shell in the chamber. Correct. To close the gun. Otherwise, when you do this, if you load the bottom now, there's nothing going into the chamber. You have to hit the button, then rack it and throw the round in. That is correct. That's and I've seen, I've seen that kind of a function issue of the gun, the way the mechanics work of the different types of gun, really mm -hmm. screw shooters up in competitions. Oh, Because the they don't understand the buttons. Yeah, under the heat of competition, you know, the one thing you have to be familiar with is the operating principles of your firearm. I know, it got me at the Nationals when I locked the gate on it, you know, because things locked back when I didn't expect it to. It took an extra shot or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I went to do one of my speed loads, and it had this really kind of cool flowering shell effect when the, the handle went this way and the tube went that way and four rounds went up in the air. Basic yard sale. Yeah, basic yard sale. Um, and the bolt's still back. And the bolt's still back, and there's no ammo in the gun. Right, and you're going, that's hmm. bad. That's not going to work, that way. I, I think uh, you can overcome that just by... Uh, it's a training re issue. Re repeated dry fire practice. Yeah, it's a training issue. Yeah.